Uh, so you should have the draft 1.1 of the amendment in front of you. Uh -huh. We do. Uh, there are two changes to the bill. The first one is very small. It's on lines 16 and 17 of page one. And it just adds a new uh, piece of information that the report has to contain, and that's the number of men and women serving right. in the National Guard. Yeah. Um, so it gives you the baseline. The next change is uh, more significant. That starts on page three on line eight. And this adds in the substance of S17 from last year. Yeah, and but it's still sitting on their wall, right? Yes, uh, and S17 basically, uh, it doesn't change the election of the adjutant general by the General Assembly, but it does add minimum requirements and qualifications for candidates for adjutant general. Uh, do you need me to go through those, or does everybody remember? I think, well, I think we've passed it at least twice. Yes. Maybe three times. Even by the new members of the committee, we have passed this. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, this is, um, these have not changed substantively since the end of the last biennium. So, yes. Uh, do you have any sense, uh, both Stephen and Damien, what the, ch what the barrier is in the House to I think, embracing um, this idea? I, I think that we'll hear. Oh, okay. In a minute. Yeah. Okay. Jumping the gun, I didn't mean to. Yeah, and I, I'm not sure I can speak for the House Committee on that. So, um, just make that. There were. Um, Do we have any technical questions? Well, there were a couple little things I thought we you uncovered on the, the original language draft. Uh, yeah. In addition to the number, there was just something about. Oh no, this is that's a different bill. Uh, oh, this is a woman. Yeah, I think we were waiting to go over that one until after you see the uh, OPR bill later this week. This is just the report on promotion. Yeah, because we are dealing with this again later in terms of reciprocals. Well, we're not dealing with this. We're dealing with the National Guard yes. with the armed services yes. in right. another bill. Right, but not this. Right. right. Okay. No, I thought that's what you were running. Yes, I was confused. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I wasn't on two bills last week. This is the, the uh, simpler of the two bills. And I, I'm glad you added that line 16 and 17 there so that we get a snapshot of what it is when we're starting because he added that the report needs to contain on page one. Six, line 16 and 17 the, the, act, the numbers of women yes. and men that are serving. And I think that came from Senator Pearson yep. as a concern. So, thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, yeah. So, I, I just have a, a technical question for you. Yes, ma'am. Not, not knowing anything about the armed services, really, at all. Do I refer to you as Major Cray or Major General Cray or Major General Ad Adjutant General Cray? Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, so most most people just address me as General Cray. General. So General is General. Okay. <laughs> um, but even though there are different ranks uh -huh. within inside the General, so the first a one star is a Brigadier General and then a two star is a Major General, and all of the Adjutants General for all of the states um, are major are major generals. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Two star generals. Count. Right, two two star generals. So um, but in sort of normal conversation, general Cray. General. Oh that's fine. Okay. I wasn't sure. Okay. Well yeah. and some of us Thank are just you. bad and call you by what we remember you And right. that's totally yeah. fine too. That's totally fine too. Um, well thank so, you that helps me because I never know what's um, <laughs> appropriate. <laughs> So. Um, that's totally fine. So I am Major General Stephen Cray. I'm your Adjutant General for the state of Vermont. Um, and uh, happy to um, add comments to 8771 as we have done already in the House. As you know, this passed out of the House. Um, and um, Representative O'Sullivan from Burlington is, is passionate about this, as yeah. you know. And, um, and actually is a very, very strong advocate for the men and women of the National Guard. She chairs our local ESGR support, supportive guard and reserve in the state of Vermont in a, in a volunteer capacity. Um, so she, she advocates for employers on how great 
the men and women of the National Guard are to serve in our, you know, to do, have jobs in our communities, right? Because you know 70% of the men and women that are in the Guard are part-time. They have jobs in the state of Vermont and other places. She's an excellent advocate for sort of, um, uh, you know, highlighting the strengths of what these National Guard men and women bring to the civilian side as well. So this is great. Um, she's obviously, obviously, obviously also passionate about the, um, the gender diversity that we have in our organization and um, will be clear, gender, gender diversity in, in, um, in the military is a, is, a, uh, is a tough problem. It's not a problem, it's, but it's a complicated and, a, and, a, and an issue that I think the military has been trying to address and struggle with and trying to improve on for many, many years. And, and um, it's a slow bureaucracy. Uh, there are, you know, just in the recent times have we opened up all of the positions within combat to allow women to serve in those places. And when you do that, and specifically when you talk about Vermont, and I'm talking about the, the Army Guard, a lot of the roles that we have are combat arms. They are, they are you know, infantry. And infantry was never open in the combat piece of it to women before. And now that we've opened that up, it's not as simple to say, um, you know, you can now you can now serve in that position. But we haven't we haven't groomed we haven't given you the qualifications and the experience and everything that you need to serve in that position. That takes some time. You can't just go and just say, okay, now you're now you're you're the leader of this organization when you've never been in that organization before. So, so you have to have a proactive plan and that's what we've been doing for a number of years. And, um, and I think this bill <coughs> will help highlight what we're doing well within the National Guard, just as we have done and you have all been involved with the sexual assault uh, and harassment legislation that we've been testifying on for a number of years now. Um, and we can clearly show you that the military, if they're good at anything, it's collecting data and making a plan to, to move forward. It's pretty good. I mean, we're pretty good at that. And um, but we have a well, we have a long ways to go, uh, as society does, and um, uh, and we have a long way to go with um, with gender diversity and and being able to increase our numbers. Um, so, I guess that's a long way of saying that this data that's requested in the bill is already there. We already we already do it. We already report it to the to the, to the federal government through the DoD choice uh, uh, channels. Um, I think it was envisioned, ma'am, to to maybe attach this along with the report that we already do with sexual assault and harassment. I think it makes sense. The timing is the same. We could include that on how we're doing um, because in the end, it's all about making our team as strong as possible. So. The more the more diverse, whether it's whether it's gender, whether it's you know race, whether it's um, uh, you know all those various backgrounds and experiences, just going to make our team stronger. And this is a, obviously a very important part of it, but it's not the only part of making our team stronger from a diversity perspective. Um, the uh, also we're going to get some help, I think, uh, by being able to to increase our numbers with the. Um, education tuition assistance uh, benefit that you know that passed the House on Friday is now here in the Senate. And the reason I bring that up is because um, by, a long, by a wide margin, uh, young women who are looking at joining the service, whether it's not the National Guard or just any military service, um, seek education benefits as the number one reason that they want to do it. They, they buy a long shot, like well into 70%. Of, of the reason of why they're, they're joining. So we're gonna be able to offer them uh, and that effort combined with this effort is gonna make some improvements. So I, I, think, I think it's, uh, it's, 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 it's very well nested. Um, we, uh, I mean, you know me, I, I'm committed to, uh, to, I mean, my job is to make the National Guard as strong from a personnel background, diverse, uh, cohesive unit as best I can to be able to do the federal job and the, and the state job and this is just this is just part of it so um, I think this is now uh, the uh, what I don't have what I didn't have is the until I just talked to you in the hallway is the s17 part of it 
Um, I have really nothing else other than to say this is the third year that we've tried to get uh, qualifications into the adjutant general um, criteria. It's very, very, in my opinion, very, very basic. It's sort of the baseline of what anybody that you would want to talk to that would serve in this capacity should have to serve at the national level. Having done this job for five years, um, I travel a lot. I interact a lot at the federal level. Um, if you do not have some of these basic qualifications, you're just not going to have a seat at the table, and Vermont is going to lose out. It's just not, it's not fair to the people that, that you and I serve to put someone in here who's not qualified to do the job, and I think that's, that's just pretty basic. And, and we agree. Could you, um, you had a conversation, I believe, with Representative Head, what was... I, I didn't catch up with Representative oh. Hill, but I, I did see Representative Stevens. I asked him as he was coming out. He said it's on it's a, you know it's on the wall. Um, we do intend to to talk about it. Um, it. There's also other legislation that's out there that you know that's included in an omnibus that right. um, that I, that the House is considering as well. And it also makes some changes to um, not it being an election, but being an appointment. Um, so I think that's maybe maybe a little bit uh, confusing for the for that committee. I'm not sure, um, but I think the biggest reason why, if you had to ask me, um, why the House um, or why why uh, uh, military affairs hasn't pushed on it is because they've been hung up on the um, the other part of the legislation that the House wanted, which was to form a committee to be able to review uh, applicants and make recommendations if there were any, any appointed, issues. If it was appointed. Right, and so we're not proposing that at this point. But, but also, no, even, even with the election, no, they, wanted, the they, election. Wanted, they wanted the committee to be able to be yes. formed. Yeah. Yeah. I remember. So if we have an issue that they, want, they, they wanted this committee to be stood up to do it. And, um, and I have testified that that is sort of internal um, mechanics of how of how the legislature works that's not really I, I don't have a, an opinion one way or the other I understand why you would want to do it but I don't have an opinion one it's not it's not uh, essential that 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 happens I do think it's essential that that whatever that you candidate be has be qualified yeah. and that's that's what I've testified for three years and that's where right. it doesn't and change. I'm sticking to it well it hasn't it hasn't changed because I, I think it's very very important I I don't want the legislature to be put in that position that they were in 2013 again. I, I, you should not, in my opinion again, uh, allow people to use this office and this process for their own personal agendas. It would be wrong. And that's what, that's what, that's right. what was attempted. And I, I, don't, I don't think you want to put yourselves in that position again. No, that was an interesting experience. That well, well, we we actually you were on the committee when we went through the election that they proposed. Mm -hmm. It was the most. <clears throat> it passed the house. Mm -hmm. It I have never seen a system set up that was so non-transparent and convoluted. Uh, it, 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 it anyway. So, but. In my experience, simple is better, right? I mean, as, as simple as yeah. you can make it is, is probably the most understandable and the most transparent that you can be. And so even Did if- have a public hearing in the house? What? We what? A, there was a, no. Was, yes, there was a place where people presented their no. candidates. Yes. It, but it was a private, it was a committee that was set up that was private. It was all confidential. <laughs> they, sure. could, they couldn't say who the candidates were so you mean in the proposed legislation? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I'm talking about the actual experience was we oh, had a, the, right. the public hearing with the people presenting themselves. Well, we did standards. too. Mm -hmm. It was together. Uh, I yeah. mean, they came and talked to us, but that wasn't the proposed legislation. No. No. No, no. no I was this just was, talking about the actual event. Right. Of this yeah. was to yeah. deal with yeah. issues if they came up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So anyway, so even if even if we pass these minimum requirements, yes, ma'am. Oh, and okay. even if they then change it to be an appointed position, this would still hold these minimum requirements. Yes, absolutely. And I think the the minimum requirements are will will 
would be valid in either in any process that you have. And if you can <clears throat> maybe send us over some information, at the time one of the questions was, and it will surely come up because it's connected to the gender study here, was <clears throat> won't those minimum requirements rule out uh, women? And you had sent over a, uh, some statistics about how many women actually would qualify under this. And if we can just have that again so that okay. Sure. Yeah, helpful. we can, we can do that. And the the minimum grade is a is a lieutenant colonel, which is um, uh, we have I minutes. Mean, there's a considerable. It's a you know as you know in the it's a pyramid, right? But um, this this that rank is too below the top anyway. So there are there are a number yeah. of women that would qualify for sure. And then when you factor in, this doesn't eliminate. Uh, women that have just or men, men or women that have just retired. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of nuances to it. So you couldn't be above 55 and be adjutant general. Oh, you could you could you could be yeah sure you could you could do that. So you don't have the require the retirement age for the as the state police do. No, not no. It, it, as you become a, a general, those those you get ages more go age. those ages go go up. I think you can actually stay. Uh, hold me to this, but I think I think you got to actually stay as a chief star general until age sixty four, maybe something like that. So it's, it's that it? Yeah, it's not that. It's not, no, it's not that. It's not that old. No, no, I it's young. It's I know, I know. Got to enjoy the retirement. <laughs> yeah. What is your term? Two years. So my, yeah, it's so do we have we approved you in the interim? So um, this current term that I'm I will um, will be up again in in February of next year in nineteen. So it's every it's in the odd year. Okay. We do it when so we, we just, first come back. We do it by voice vote yeah. or something because it's not. Well, we did it by voice vote this last time because you were the only candidate. Yeah. Right, right. But if there's yes. others that yeah. run or if I don't, then yeah. then there would be. Yeah. And that was we in the joint session. Yeah, yeah it's always joint session. I just didn't remember. Sergeant at arms. I certainly arms. remember your initial election. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. the same day as the sergeant at arms yeah. and the UVM trustees. It's like the third week of February ish. Okay. Any more comments? No, Any more questions? I, I will make an observation, okay. which is um, on his jacket, it tells you what to call him. No, it doesn't. No. It says right there what his name is. Well, it says people, which is why I always come to because there it is. That is true, but sometimes, sometimes protocol demands that you use a title yes. because of respectful respect manners. of the position. Manners. 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 And I, I'm actually fairly informal, <laughs> as he knows. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't expect him to call me Senator. I would expect him to call oh. me Alice. In some circumstances, I would expect him to call me. Yes, and obvious. In some, I would expect him that he would feel more comfortable calling me senator. So that's right. So thank you. That was helpful. That clarification of why we think there are barriers upstairs. So this is good. That's very good. No, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I will keep our my fingers crossed that this will. They're going to love it. Help. They are going to love it. Wait till she hears. If she hasn't already, does she know? Probably not. I don't think I'll, let you, I'll, let, you I'll let you I'll let you break the word. I'm sorry. I'm I'll let not you giving Helen a heads up. <laughs> oh ho, ho. No, I'll so let I think you. we should just wait until it gets on the floor and report it and pass it out. Okay then. Send I'll send it over. Thanks. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Enjoy, uh, enjoy the day. You too. Yeah, I I knew that it was connected to that vote thing. They that the appointment thing. No, not the appointment thing. They want to have this Better. arcane system. Well, it's not even arcane because it's it's just totally non-transparent. It's I don't know if you oh, remember. Oh, it's sort of like the judicial review or whatever. No, it isn't at all. Well, in that there's a committee that would vet the candidates. And but there's but you can't disclose. They can't. Nobody knows who. Who's submitted the names? Well, I'm oh, sorry, judicial. Yeah, no review. That's the same thing. You don't know who's applied to be a judge. That's very much. A oh, it is judicial nominee. Nominee. Judicial nominee. It's fair. Yeah, I'm on that. 
they want it. It's not no. insane. It's something that we I, use for a lot of things. But, but. I, how does judicial nominating work? They people in, people in put private, in their applications. They put in their names and they get vetted, and certain names get sent to the governor. Right. And how do they get vetted? By, By a committee. Okay. committee. And how do, what does the committee call everybody up? No, they, they, they interview them. Interview. They interview them, but right. that wasn't the that wasn't the reason for the National Guard Committee. The National Guard Committee was set up so that, and it was clearly in response to the it one candidate. Yeah. No, it was not in response to him. It was in response to far, um, the other guy far, had some kind of a sexual assault against, um, complaint allegation against him. And so this committee was set up so that people could come in and testify in private if there were complaints. Yeah. But they could, nobody could release the names, so no one would know that they could go in and testify to the committee because you couldn't say who had submitted their names. Right. So there was no way of getting the word out. Right. So it, it was very different than judicial nominating. And then they were going to... Then they weren't going to recommend names. They were going to then write a report and say, these people are OK and these people aren't, but you still ha get to vote on all of them. It was crazy. I think it's a lot simpler doing what we do now. Either that or and, appointing and them. I will say that I'm not a fan the system of sort of takes care of itself. Right? Yeah, yeah. For good or bad, we have figured out how to elect quality, qualified yeah. people. Yeah. And I think what we're doing here in this bill will help enormously because it, w it would have helped the situation that we went through in 2013. With Jimmy. Yeah. With Jimmy, but yeah. not with the Senate. With Not with the other one. That he was, he wasn't qualified. He met the minimum requirements. Mm -hmm. One and of them did. Jimmy did. Jimmy did. Right. But the other one did. And the, it was the other one that spurred this and because he was a good friend of Willem's. And Willem almost pushed me down the stairs because he was so mad at me because we didn't pass it. Oh, it was a Willem B. It was. B. Uh, German. Tim. Tim oh. Yeah, we vote on H771 as amended. As soon as Allison finishes. Okay, I'm just in the process of text to Claire. Uh, Clarkson. Yes. Pearson. Yes. Here. Question mark. Column. Yes. White. Yes. Great. Motions. Both motions carry five. Do you want to? No. Oh, I'm happy to report this one. I've been it's reporting this baby. one five times. Unless somebody wants to. I don't really want to. Okay. You. I'm happy to. Okay. Great. So White is going to report it, Gosh, and it is great. great. Thank you, Damien. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you for your time. Yeah. No, well, thank our you. Our time is your time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so 2 o'clock we'll be back, and we're going to okay. do H700, which is the minutes uh, and the open meeting. Yep. We're on H700. Okay, H seven hundred. I'm here. There are two. Open yes, there are two open meeting laws, and should we get done with H seven hundred, Helena has offered to walk us through H nine ten because that is also her bill and an open meeting law bill. But right now we're focusing on H seven hundred. Thank you. You sounded just like I went whitewater after Did with some of my sisters and my dad. He said, he said, okay, everybody, okay. backpedal. <laughs> okay, so we, I think we have uh, uh, looked at this bill, and we know that uh, they changed it to, to, all they did is add um, excluding holidays. Correct. Yes. Okay. The bill is introduced, it's different, and then this is, but you have the as pass test. Yes. yes. Just excluding. So I think that we can just take testimony on it. Chris, did you have a question? Just what was different? Did they say? What? Did they did they say? What, what was the original? 
Uh, the bill is introduced, um, would have excluded uh, or changed um, five calendar days to five business days. Yes. Business days would have That's excluded right. not only holidays, but also weekends. Now the bill only excludes holidays. Got it. Yes. And we're not going to have a discussion about that because we're going to hear from the testimony first, and then we'll have the discussion because Helena just drafted the bill. She doesn't know why they did it or, or she might know why they did it, but it's not She's very insightful. She doesn't. She doesn't have to um, defend their position. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Elena. <laughs> Allison, did you have a question? Uh, I, I guess we will have conversation after we hear from our witnesses. Yes, I would suggest that we do it that way. I was being restrained. Okay. All right. That's what they'll look at. <laughs> Gwen, Jenny, did you want to testify on this? Or I can if you would like me to. I mean, sure. Sure. okay. All right. We're first. No, whatever. Gwen Zaka, BLCT. Um, so I, we support this bill. We supported the as introduced bill, and then we support the as amended bill. <laughs> so it's called the whatever. <laughs> um, it was pushed forth by, uh, it wasn't our, our, our bill, but it was uh, pushed forth by uh, a few towns and a representative who had, uh, had some uh, boards um, that were having trouble uh, with getting their information out there and on the internet and on their websites on time. Um, and it wasn't necessarily with boards like, you know, a select board, but sort of the smaller um, commissions and boards that meet very infrequently and who do not have professional staff and um, are really scrambling to um, get their minutes together and this was the proposal they put forth with getting rid of the weekends and allowing um, more time um, to post and this was the compromise language um, that I believe was supported by most if not all but um, it didn't go as far as we would like, but it's it's something at least those who are writing the minutes are having the responsibility of posting them usually for free, with no compensation, won't have to work on Christmas or um, Fourth of July. Madam Chair, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but I am confused. I thought that our underlying bill said five business days. No. It's, I believe our underlying bill said five days. The, the very first original bill said five days we clarified it but but what's in statute what's in calendar. statute right calendar. now says five calendar. calendar days oh okay but our town want five days well days. but we will Okay. For some reason, I thought we uh, the LCT supported the original. There was a lot of pushback uh, that um, I'll, I'll let other folks speak for why there was pushback to it. How did they so choose? But um, there was reservation from um, other folks who felt it wasn't an onerous position to be put in to work with um, the language as is, and so even this was maybe they felt uncomfortable even with this, but it's a compromise. It, be, it became an issue. It's been in law since 1970 or something. It became an issue when we said they had to put post it. Because for some reason, there are some towns who can't figure out how to post. It's not. But they're draft agendas. They don't that, have to be adopted no, or anything, right? Well, the, it, I can speak to that. You're right. There, there is no requirement yeah. that they be finalized. But the, the, the common theme you hear from those who have uh, issues with that is that, the, especially for the committees that don't meet frequently, mm -hmm. um, sure even on a regular was. schedule or maybe sort of like an ad hoc sort of meeting, um, is that there's so much time in between that you know they want to get it right the first time. There's also the issue of having put out information that the general public sees as sort of a work product that they either see as incomplete um, you know, they, you know, sending the wrong, not necessarily wrong information, but also information that might not look presentable or be exactly what the representation of that committee might be. There's also been instances of um, when you're a committee and you are making decisions, I've heard uh, concerns from individual members of committees who look at minutes that are drafted by whomever is in, and it generally isn't someone that they, someone that they hire to do it, but maybe the town clerk steps in or some administrative assistant um, for the select board, it might be someone that's on that board who might have a biased interpretation and might have minutes reflect something that might not be 
the um, what the entire board thinks is actually what happened. So that's where you're kind of getting into sort of, yes, you're correct, that's technically they don't have to. Yeah. Um, so there's those concerns as well. It's, it's never easy, but those were some of the concerns. Right. So I have a couple questions for you. Sure. Um, there must be more than one occasion where someone is the secretary for the cemetery commission and also for the board of selectmen and maybe for the recreation committee or mm -hmm. department. Is that part of why this becomes some, somewhat cumbersome to get all, because they're obviously meeting at different times, and, right. and, and, but they now they have three meetings worth of minutes to take care of. And depending on where that meeting falls, like if it's on a Wednesday and you have five calendar days, you know, you're working into the weekend because technically you have Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, then you're into Saturday, Sunday. So you're getting it out by Friday if you don't want to be in violation by Monday. Um, so that was, that's part of it. Um, I think you're going to hear, you, I mean, I even heard concerns from big communities. Um, I've heard concerns from small communities. I've heard concerns from select boards. I've heard concerns from the ad hoc dog committee or what, you know, so you heard concerns for a variety of reasons. Um, it's not just that, but that could be part of it. So I have another question. I'll sure. let Helena. Helena, did you have to clarify? Oh, I just, just, if it's on Wednesday, that talks about five days from the date of the meeting, so you start day Thursday. one is Thursday. Okay, so yeah. Wednesday, so yeah. Tuesday. Thursday, Friday. Yeah. So with that in mind, you must have a sense of how many people sort of fill dual or triple roles right. somewhat. Right. Do you, the VLCT, offer training to kind of help these people? Sure. I mean, if somebody asked me sure. to take minutes, yeah. It would be probably a different sure. kind and, of look than if they asked right, them. and you'll see a, a wide variety of what minutes look like depending on who's taking them because there's a very bare minimum standard in statute. The minutes mm -hmm. have to, you know, accurately reflect the, you know, certain instances. But it could, you could literally have minutes be very short and succinct. But then you'll have um, instances where the minutes are very detailed, show every every action, um, every discussion, and that's really up to the whim of whatever commissioner board, you know, what they decide is appropriate for them, um, and what kind of record they want to keep. Um, and that's probably part of why there's concerns is because, you know, it's easy to say, oh, we'll just throw up minutes that show the bare minimum, but um, that board might say that's not, that's not really helping anything. That's, that's the very bare minimum. That's actually stuff you could probably gather from the agenda that's already been put forth. We already kind of know what the agenda items were. We're trying to get a little bit deeper in terms of what the actual outcomes were. Um, so you'll see a, a wide variety when we get calls in, and I know the Secretary of State's office also helps with this. You know, we can tell them this is what the law says. It's actually very minimum in terms of bare standards, and that's a pretty easy thing to, to grasp. It's, it's when you go beyond that. So um, you guys do? Sure, yeah. Train? Yeah, absolutely. That doesn't make it easier necessarily. So, but am I right here that it there are also no requirements that minutes be approved. In the statute, there is no right. requirement. That is, right. That's up to the particular right. body about whether they do Absolutely. that or not. That's not, hmm. okay, that's not a statutory requirement. No, but there, but boards and commissions do use the minutes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, they do, but, but yes. I'm just saying, yeah. there's no, right. you, there is no, there would be, statutorily, there would be no such thing as draft minutes. No requirement. Because there's nothing, no such thing there's as just approved minutes. minutes. So just there's minutes. just minutes. So, Allison? So I sent you all the email from our right. wonderful uh, zoning and planning <coughs> uh, yeah. with yes. Woodstock. And it is, it's a, it's a huge burden when you have, when you're expected to do the minutes for all these meetings that are all happening at the same time. Um, as the chair of the Billings Park Commission, our Parks Commission in Woodstock, I would say that it is, uh, uh, it, 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 we have noticed that there are often times when we are not complying with the open meeting law just simply because there's no one who's willing to do it and you don't have a secretary on most of those commissions. The irregular commissions aren't even set up to do this. Um, getting the agenda posted is a pain in the neck. Uh, all of it, so, and I have had now several towns request that we change this to five business days and get rid of the calendar. It is a burden for many towns and busy towns. It's particularly a burden on, and so I would actually have proposed earlier that we change it to uh, seven to ten days. But I understand that there may not be support for that. But I think at bare minimum we need to change it to business days rather than calendar days. 
We, I, I, this is, I know you supported it. The opinion law is the gift that keeps on giving. It'll yeah. keep coming back whether you like it or not. And you tried so many different avenues to sort of apply, mm -hmm. to provide yeah. that flexibility. I know there's a bill on the wall that's not going anywhere in the house that would say that these, uh, there would be a, a more lenient standard in terms of these deadlines for postings for let's say committees or boards that aren't statutorily created. So not you know not your planning commissions and your DRBs, your select board, but maybe your ad hoc committees. Well like not the Parks Commission. That, I mean, they, we've tried def def it's, several permutations of it, but it's you, it, it's not gonna we're we we need to be hear from Jenny and we're gonna hear from two people from the press. Um but huh? And, and I will say that the, we had the conversation many times about whether other committees should not have to do them on time. And you would be very unhappy if your tree committee met on Wednesday night and they didn't post their minutes until... I wouldn't care when they... No, post. listen. And they made the decision to cut down the, the maples <laughs> on the green. And Saturday morning you got there and all the maples were cut And down. what were you going to do about it? So you knew about it. What were you going to do if about it? If you saw it in the minutes, you could probably oppose it. But, I, but I anyway, it okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So, so, but I think business days is thoughtful. For okay. The people who we're, are going to do it. Okay. We're going to hear from these other people, and then we can have the, press, the have and then we can have the discussion about what we think should happen. But let's hear from these other, our other witnesses first before we start making up our minds. Okay. Do you want to have the first yes. witness now? Yeah. Or, okay. Well, you can get them on the phone while we're hearing from Jenny. Okay. Yeah, thanks. He's your Addison Independent? Jenny? He's not the owner. But he's, he's the editor. He's representing the Vermont Press Association. Oh, yes. Okay. He called this morning. Yes. Jenny? Hello, Jenny Prosser, Secretary of State's Office. Um, so, we do oppose this bill. We prefer that the law would stay the way it's currently written in five calendar days. We do think that what passed the House is an improvement over what was initially proposed because of our concerns with the business um, business day language. And so I think we recognize that there are small boards with volunteer staff that are having trouble here. That needs to be balanced against the need for access to this record of what has happened for the reasons that you were just discussing so that people can understand what has happened, perhaps talk to their legislators, perhaps make sure they attend the next meeting, take whatever recourse they have available to them in the statutes or other law. Um, and and I, 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 so we object to any lengthening of that period of time that would make it more difficult for folks to be able to know what's occurred at these public meetings. Um, and I, I guess I'll, I can speak to what our concern with, with the original business day language was specifically that the original um, proposal didn't define business days. Um, and I think most people have a kind of standard con No, I, I, I know. I know, and I can tell you the multiple places in statute where business days is defined and it's not consistent. Um, you know, we have day open to provide services, we have calendar days minus weekends of specified holidays, we have Mondays through Thursdays excluding legal holidays at any other time or the day before such time, municipal offices are not open to the public. That's for municipal water and sewer notice. It's very small, you know, very narrow situation where that would occur, but that, you know, that's a definition that is in statute. So it's not consistent. Um, and so our concern would be because that there would be this opportunity for a, a much greater length of time, uh, particularly because the Public Records Act talks about, I believe it's days open to provide services, that might be paraphrasing a little bit. Um, and so if someone might extrapolate, that would be the appropriate definition. And then you have a town office that's open one, two, three days a week. Suddenly you're talking about a lot more than five days. So that was our concern. So what if we define it? And, I think, and that was discussed, and I think that would be an improvement if you're going to go that way. And there was some there was some language tossed around on that too, defining it as um, I think the, the looking back to the days classified as holidays, um, and there is a definition of involved state holidays, which don't necessarily match you know what towns are doing, but for consistency's sake. Mm -hmm. You can also exclude weekends, uh, which are holidays. 
as long as you excluded weekends. You added excluding weekends, well, that might solve it. Now you're we, we can talk about how yeah. to define it. Yeah. yeah. No, I'd like to define it. It's yes. fine. Let's hear from John Flowers. Let's hear what he has to say. Any more questions for Jenny? Thank you. Thank you. Certainly. Push the button. Push the button and uh, Hi, John. there's another question. We're putting you through. Thank you. Oh, she has John? Some. Yes. Good. You, you're there. Yes, I am. There you are. So, John, we are um, talking about S700 and, I mean, H700, and we would like to hear your position on it and what would be acceptable to you if any changes were made. Thank you. Well, go ahead. Uh, 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 just for context, I've, I've been a reporter in Vermont for 28 years, all of them with The Independent. Um, I am the past president of the Vermont Press Association and still am keenly interested in laws affecting uh, the media and uh, print reporters. And we, uh, I think I can safely state for the organization that we uh, believe that, continue to believe that the, the, the five days, the current five days, is adequate for minute takers to prepare a rudimentary draft account of the actions taken at a public meeting. Um, I believe the current standards allow the, the minute takers to offer the mere basics, uh, namely the motion, the results of the vote tally, who was for and who was against. This in turn provides a key heads up to reporters to follow up and to, to fill in the details in their subsequent reporting and, and it allows the minute takers to flesh out their respective accounts uh, of the meeting uh, for final approval uh, of the board at their next regular meeting. Uh, here, here at the Independent, we cover 23 communities. We can't be at every meeting. Uh, uh, timely uh, minutes accessed online are really a key vehicle for our reporting. They provide a stepping stone for us to do research. They aren't the end all be all of what we do, but <clears throat> nonetheless, it's very important to us to get uh, notification in a timely manner of the decisions that are made at these public meetings. So we believe that, that, that five days should be, continue to be adequate for uh, minute takers to generate a draft. If, if it were um, five business days with a very clear definition of what business days meant so that the town clerk that's only off, open on Tuesdays and Thursdays didn't have f five weeks for their five business days, <coughs> is that something that the Press Association would be amenable to? Well, um, I think we would be willing to be flexible on that. Um, as you mentioned, our concern has been that business days are defined mm -hmm. in, uh, community, in, in communities with town clerk's offices that have sporadic hours to be, you know, a day that that particular uh, town clerk's office is open. So uh, if it were redefined uh, in another way, uh, but still did not extend too far the uh, the minimum timeline for generating those minutes, uh, we'd certainly be uh, like to be part of that discussion. You are right now. Yeah, I was going right. to say. Uh, I mean, without without being able to take a straw poll of my colleagues on the VTA board, I'm kind of going by the seat of my pants here. Okay. Allison. John, hi, Allison Clarkson, Windsor County. Um, Thank you for being possibly flexible on this. Have you, do you serve on a town board or commission? <clears throat> I do not, and part of that is to avoid conflict of interest. Uh, so I, I only, my service has been confined to the VBA board. I, I don't even sign petitions for a town meeting, proposed town meeting day appropriations for, for human services requests, so. But I can guarantee you he's been to more meetings than anyone at this table. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I don't know about that, but it's probably close. Yeah. And, and, and that's your business, so you're, yeah. being, you're being paid for that, and I appreciate that. And I appreciate your work, because I think the Addison Independent is one fine paper. Um, I also think that for us to, to uh, we're, I, I, we have heard, I represent 26 towns, um, and I've heard from many of them that this is a, a, a burden uh, and, and they would really like it to move to business days. 
I'm, you know, I'm happy to help for-profit uh, news outlets, but I also think that you are, you know, the people who are actually having to do this work are also need to be weighed, and I, I think that if we can move it to five business days by defining it, that would be very helpful for the towns that have voiced their concern to me. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, a lot of it would go into the definition of business days, and, and uh, it's not only, I'd like to think that this is not only for us, you have parties, uh, aside from the media, that are very interested in decisions that a board takes, uh, might not be able to get in touch with uh, a representative of a board for either vacations or some other reason and would like to refer to the minutes uh, quickly to see at least what the basic decision was. Uh, and they could call somebody. Yeah, in, in, in smaller towns, and, and you know, I'm talking. Sometimes we cover issues in Granville and Goshen and places like that, and it can be very hard to get people in the know in a timely manner, especially you know when you're staring at a deadline. Um, so, and again, the minutes. I, I can't stress enough how basic the minutes need only be. I mean, just a, a basic recording of. of the motion, how the vote turned out, who voted pro, who voted con. And I, we have examples, I think in Shelburne of, of the board, uh, it has taken screenshots of handwritten draft minutes and posted those uh, in, a, in a very timely manner. Um, and I know some town clerks uh, like to elaborate and include a lot of details, and we certainly appreciate that. But in terms of a first look at how the town has uh, or town boards have made decisions and, and, and so forth. It's very uh, important, I think, to have that, that first evidence of action taken at, uh, at a board meeting. You know, some, some of the larger communities we cover have uh, cable access, community access, television, and, and of course, you know, you can access that at any point online through your computer, so you, yeah. can, you can get very uh, timely gratification in that regard. But, um, when it comes to some of, some of the smaller communities that, that have boards that meet sporadically, uh, the minutes provide really a key uh, first tell on, on town business. John Bright, Collimore from Rutland County. Um, obviously, all Vermonters are very interested in this whole transparency issue and, and being able to access what's happening in, in government. So you mentioned that you covered 23 communities with the Addison Independent, right? Correct. So if you had to, without mentioning anyone's town or name, give them sort of a between 0 and 100% compliance figure out of those 23 towns, what, what would you say it is? Is everybody able to, to, to kind of live with the way it is, or are there constantly sort of commissions or, or boards that you know are meeting that you're not being able to get the information? I would say we're at about 60 to 70 percent compliance. Now those that aren't complying have either kind of thrown up their hands and taken down their website. Um, I believe that's the advice of the VLCT or uh, they have officials that simply aren't well versed in the law. They're, they're volunteers who work very sporadically and they be, may be unaware of what state law is and we find that if a gentle reminder often spurs them into compliance then I, and I think some people uh, don't know uh, what the basic requirements are for minutes that they can be very skeletal if you will and uh, that making them available within five days shouldn't be that big deal, as big a deal of at least the way we see it. Okay. I, I have to say, I, I wonder who's reading them. Uh, in other words, if, if it takes the towns and municipalities so long to, to get them, is there someone at the newspaper that actually reads every the minutes of every meeting? Uh, well, I admit that I, that I don't have cause to look at the Hancock uh, Zilk, uh, Conservation Commission meetings uh, minutes quite a lot, but uh, we do, uh, especially to the more remote towns where we can't be there in person, uh, it is very helpful and handy for us to be able to, to see them and then follow up from there. And some of these minutes, you know, a, a couple lines and minutes uh, become the foundation or precursor to 
some pretty big stories, whether they be feature stories or uh, stories about trends in local government. So yeah, they're important. And I'm sympathetic because I work at a communications company, so I know that part of what you hope to glean from those is a story. Right. Mm -hmm. And as Senator Ayer points out to me that many people read the newspaper, so they don't have to read the minutes. Um, I mean, that, that, that's a fact. Yeah, I, I would agree with our esteemed senator. <laughs> Very good choice. You took the words right out of our mouth. Yeah, you did. You did. <laughs> Thank you, John. We're also going to hear from Randy Capitani. Uh, so, uh, great. We're gonna well, thanks so much for accepting my testimony over the phone. Yeah. It, it saved me a, a couple hours commute, and uh, I'll get right back to it. Thank you. Go to Do you want to call Randy? I think if you read the memo, you'll understand. I, I know. I know. I just um, So I did look up while we're dialing Randy here. The Title I, and also in the pub, which is just the kind of general title, right, for common understanding, and also in the public records, it defines business day means a day that a public oh, agency is open to provide Randy access. Topic. That means if a town is, has, is open two days a week, their business day, if we use business day without a definition, it would be three and a half weeks later. Right, so we but, can do a better day. No, no, no I'm, I'm just saying that that is, there are definitions all over the, right. that. So if we were to change this, we, would, we have to use a better definition. Um, a definition. Yes. That one of those things you do in the we being you do in the summer. You go through all the records and look no. for business days. No, because they have different meanings in different statutes, and, and we can't oh, change. And, and then make a list so that legislators can look at them and decide what they have. Those technical questions. Yeah. 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 We define a term when it so seems can you hear to us? be needful, right? Um, oh, sorry. No, that's, that's all right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, we're, we're here, Randy. Yeah. Hang on. And under principles of statutory construction, when you don't have a definition, you use dictionary definitions. That's what, that's what would court case after court case after court case say, besides the Merriam-Webster or, you know, um, World Heritage Dictionary, they, they use that. So sometimes definitions are needed. Um, for things that are, you know, everyone agrees on the definition of, under a dictionary if you want to deviate from sort of the normal understood dictionary definition, right? That's one reason it defines mm -hmm. something. Um, or if it's likely to be disagreed about even though it has a dictionary definition, and I think it sounds like this falls into that latter category. Yes. Right? There's a clear dictionary definition of business day, which is weekdays, excluding holidays. Right. It's your common understanding of, of what it means, but because there's been talk about confusion, it seems like one of those, even though there's a commonly understood understanding of what it meaning, then... And why it ever got changed to calendar days in the first place, it's a puzzle to me. I think it always has Probably been calendar days. I thought you just said it was, I thought or it was no, I five said it days. Was, it might have just been days and it was... It was clarified. Then it was clarified. Someone made a mistake yeah. in the open meeting law to make a calendar. Day no, it is. Well, whether it was a mistake or not, it, it was done. I don't know that it was a mistake. Um, but Randy, did you, hi, this is Jeanette. Hi. Um, so here we are. We've heard from. We're looking at H seven hundred, <coughs> and uh, John Flowers just testified to us. Oh, good. And. If you would like to tell us where you are on here and what, if, if we did any changes, what might be um, acceptable or not. Okay, um, I'll go through, I, I got a feeling I'm probably gonna mention some of the same things John had talked about just because we've been, uh, I am also on the VPA executive board, so we've been sort of emailing mm -hmm. and talking back and forth about some of this. Uh, but really, I'm coming down to it from somebody who publishes a weekly newspaper and if you do make changes, you have to be, I think, cognizant of the time factor in terms of timeliness to get news out. 
And I think we all want transparency with this stuff. It's just a matter of how we get there. Uh, and um, Jeanette and I, uh, Senator White and I did speak a little bit yesterday about this. And uh, my, my feeling is that if, uh, well, my first feeling is, is if we can keep it the same, I think that would be the best solution because it's the law and it's the understanding people work under now. I understand there are problems in terms of turnaround and trying to get minutes out in a timely manner. And I think some of that could be mitigated with some training for, for people who take minutes. And I think you know the press association will be willing to work with BLCT if that's something that they're interested in to help people understand what you know, what needs to be in minutes. The, 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 I've covered so many boards, hundreds of boards over the years. I don't think people really understand exactly what needs to go into minutes and what can be a first draft and what can be a final draft. And usually there, you know, there's time for both. So that would be the first thing. Um, you know, I think if you're looking at extending it to five business days, or it sounds like I just heard a little discussion about five days, including a holiday. Uh, you know, that would certainly be a compromise we could live with, and I think Senator White has probably made the point that if you're going to change it, five is the number to stay with because it's the number that people are used to working sorry. with already. Sorry, Randy. No, you... I, ha I haven't made that point yet. <laughs> oh, oops, sorry. Oops, that's okay. <laughs> Randy, would you be kind enough to identify yourself for the record? Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Randy Capitani. I'm a publisher of the Deerfield Valley News. We're based in Wilmington, Vermont, and uh, I'm also a member of the Vermont Press Association Board. <clears throat> of directors. Uh, I've been a publisher for 25 years and, um, you know, been a member of the New England Press Association, served as president of the New England Press Association for a number of years, been involved in open meeting uh, discussions on a number of different levels on and off in my career. May I ask Brandon question? So, hi, Randy. I'm Allison Clarkson, Windsor County. Hi, Allison. How are you, Senator? Oh, it, it's lovely to have you joining us. In a Thank you. Um, have you ever served on a, a town board or commission? Uh, I have not served on a town select board or school board. I have been on a number of sort of smaller, lesser boards, if you will. Most recently I served, I live in the town of Dover, and most recently I served on our Act 46 study committee that did recommend a consolidation with the towns of Wardsboro and Marlboro, which Wardsboro did, did uh, vote to join in with us. Marlboro did not. You might be familiar with that. Right. Um, I've also been on a number of economic development committees over the years, um, but in terms of select board or school board, I've always felt a news reporter should be part of the newsmakers. So right. No, no. From those. You don't need to be on the select board to have to produce minutes. So. Uh, were, oh, I understand that. Were, and, were you were you responsible for the minutes for your Act 46 meeting? I was not. We paid somebody to do that, and they did a very good job getting them out in a timely right. manner. However, I did serve on an economic development committee for the town of Dover, and at one point I was secretary and did take minutes for that. Um, and, and that's where your newspaper expertise came in handy? Well, you know, it, you know it, it certainly um, I know how to work with the deadline, so, and, and people in this business tend to work to the deadline, so if it's a day, we tend to get it done in a day. If it's five days, we tend to get it done in four or five days, and if it's seven or eight days, we tend to get it done in six, seven, or eight days. Work, work fills the time available. Yeah, exactly. But and I think that's, I think that's kind of human nature in, in many ways. It, it, it is, except you're also a professional. And um, I, at serving as a chair of a parks commission, uh, this is a, this is a, a burden. And our uh, many of the towns I represent, I represent 26 towns. Right. And a number of them have asked to move it to five business days. And I'm, yeah. It just, it particularly with towns that are very active and yeah. they have. Administrators who are, are staffing several of those commi committees and commissions, it's a mm -hmm. real burden to do it in calendar days, and it would be a, a much, it would be a big help to move it to business days. And it sounds like you're open if we can define it. Well, I, I think I think you want to be careful not to go down a slippery slope of going too far backwards. I mean, we all want transparency in government. We all understand, particularly in this state. Everybody is overworked and underpaid, and we don't have enough time to do everything we need to do. Um, but we also need to work together, I think, to find what makes common sense. Right. And, um, 
Yeah, yeah, ideally, I think, you know, from the press association perspective, we'd like to keep it the way it is because that's something we all know and work with. If, if there has to be a compromise, you know, let's, let's keep it within sort of shouting distance of where we're at right now, I guess is a way to say it. So, Randy, that's, I will, um, Randy and I had this conversation the other day and I said that um, if there was any kind of a movement, it makes psychologically, I think, more sense to go to five business days than seven yeah. calendar days because even though they're the same, Moving from five to seven sounds like you're making a huge move. Mm -hmm. Moving from five to five doesn't. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I. It's exactly the same thing. Well, and in many cases, it's the same, same, same way. Yeah. But you're not you're not increasing the number, the actual number. So anyway, that was the conversation that Randy and I had the other day. Yeah, and and um, you know, again, I think we all have to be open-minded about this. Uh, it, you know what? You know what's interesting, and I I was reading through the uh, the the draft of the bill this morning, and um, it's interesting that that the the and I hadn't noticed this before, but obviously this has been long for a while. Is that the wording allows minutes to be removed from a website after a year, which I think is kind of interesting. <laughs> they could be lost for forever if that happens, you know. But that's not what that's not the scope of what you guys are talking about. I just found it interesting. That was in there. But I think they have to have written, they have to keep, um, they have to keep the minutes, they don't have to keep them on the website, they have to keep the minutes. The Secretary of State, the State Archivist has a, a real clear um, schedule for when records can be destroyed, how long they have to be kept, which yeah. type, types of records, but I think that it was keeping them on the website. Yeah, and, and I, and yeah, yeah, it is, and I just find that kind of interesting. Here we are discussing about how soon they have to be posted, and yet, you know, 360 days from when they're posted, they should be removed. Right. But anyway, it's just kind of funny. <laughs> um, but no, I appreciate your efforts on this, and I appreciate having a chance to have a discussion about this. Um, you know, do you have any questions you want to ask me in terms about what I found, you know, over the years as a as a you know newspaper publisher and a journalist and a reporter? Because honestly, we don't have a big problem in our particular towns with minutes not being posted. Um, we have bigger issues with open meeting laws. People tend to not understand those. I think people get. You know, when there's a deadline, whether it's five days or five calendar days or five working days, they understand what that is. So, Randy, it's Brian Collimore from Rutland. Um, Hello, Senator. Hi. So we just talked to John uh, Flowers, and so I'll pose the same question to him. He said the Addison Independent covers about 23 towns uh, in Addison County, and he, I asked him if you could go between zero and 100% compliance without specifying <laughs> which board or commission or even town doesn't do it well. What would be the number for you in terms of compliance? We cover as a core, uh, a core communities nine towns. Okay. And I, I know that eight of those are absolutely rigidly compliant. The ninth one, I don't have any direct interaction with, so I can't say that I know that. Although I think they are because I don't hear much from our reporters that they're a problem. Okay. His number was substantially less. I, and again, I think he's probably right. He's got a different set of communities to work with. We have, we have a lot of very small towns, Halifax, Searsburg, Wardsboro, um, and they only meet every other week. So they tend to be pretty efficient when they get stuff done. And can I just make for the record sure that I'm saying this correctly, that you are representing the Vermont Press Association? Yes, John? I am at this point secretary of the, sec, uh, the association. Because okay. um, that'll be important when we go to kind of decide here that both of you have indicated, and again, I'll, if I'm not saying this correctly, please jump in, that while you would rather have it remain the way it is in law, you would be at least open to changing it the way we've described to five business days. I think that's fair, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I will say one other thing, though, and this goes back to the news reporting, and I might have touched on this earlier. When you get beyond five calendar days, or even even when you get to five calendar days, depending on how, I'm sorry, five working days, 
depending on how news cycles break. That, that might mean something could be reported in a weekly like us, or even, well, not so much with a twice a week like the Addison, but in a weekly like us, certainly it, it could be two weeks before something is reported because we may not have the time to get to it or to get to it on our website uh, or with our ad cycle. So for example, if somebody resigns from a town commission or a town board or if a town employee is terminated, that news might go unreported for 10 days to two weeks. So that's something to consider. Yeah, no, and I understand that. Um, yeah. Well, then the daily fixes. Well, <laughs> there, yeah, no, there is no daily. Well, Valley, it's, my neck of the okay. woods, Valley News picks it up. Okay. Yeah. When, what Phil okay. Camp doesn't do, the Valley News does. Okay. Yeah, and I just, you know, I think you guys do a great job, and I appreciate you taking the time to listen to us today. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. All right, you need anything else from me? Time, no, staff. I'm, I'll get that article to you pretty soon. I hated my first draft. Okay, great. It sounded too awful. All right, well, remember, we're on deadline. Senator. I know, I know. <laughs> Thanks. One Take care, everybody. Bye. You One too, Randy. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So, um, I I would propose that we we change this to five business days with and define business days as the way it's defined in uh, 1 VSA 371, which is a calendar day except Saturday, Sunday, or any day classified as a, I mean, it, it's in the Commerce and Trade one, or any day classified as a holiday under 1 VSA 371. And so that means that. It could mean six days. If it's all. It could mean seven days. If it's. If the if it starts on if the meeting is on Monday, right? Yeah. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Well, then we can, I mean, we Thursday, can make it start sooner. Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 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 Thursday, Friday, Monday. Tuesday. Monday. It's Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah. Would be, they'd have to be public. If there was a holiday in there, it could be. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I thought, but that's the yeah. worst yeah. case scenario. And um, and that also helps define it because there are town clerk's offices that are open on Saturday. Huh? So though that, if you define it as their business day, then that's yeah. the case. No, it's right. holiday. 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 And then we'll take testimony on it, on where we are. Yes. Is, I just would like to ask uh, Helena, is, is there another definition that we ought to be considering? Because I think that's a good one, but is there another one, that uh, another business day definition that we might be looking at? Or is um, that the, the, the best one, option? The ones that I'm familiar with are the ones that are geared towards when town offices are open, which you're clearly not. Yeah, no, we don't want to go there. Um, so the ones I'm familiar with, a kind of a shorter version of what you described is a weekday excluding a holiday, but I'm afraid even that people might misconstrue. I think that if the clear intent is we just want to exclude Saturdays and Sundays and, and the holidays, holidays that are officially holidays. designated, then say that any calendar day right. except Saturdays, Sundays, or the holidays. I and it's already in statute. Yeah, yeah. in a couple yeah. different, and it's in, in, in a couple different places. places. Yeah. Yeah. Chris? The only, I, I'm happy with that suggestion, I like it. The only question I have, and uh, I'm not advocating strongly for it, is the idea if that deadline ends up being beyond the next meeting. So if, if the select board meets Monday and then meets the next Monday, but their prior Monday's minutes aren't due till Tuesday. You see what I mean? No, no, this, this doesn't say that you shouldn't do your minutes for your next meeting. This says when they have to be posted. And no, I understand, but so. Yeah, I, but, okay, I, I, so what I, is I, the difference in the law? You're, how, how could you have a meeting to review what you did at the last meeting without the It's minutes? not about being reviewed. It's about having them available to the public before, before the, the next, next meeting. meeting. But I suppose if you have it, somebody who meets every it, week. It does it, make it complicated. Does anybody meet mm -hmm. every week? Sure. So it counts. Sure. Well, every once in a while you'll have a meeting that's urgent and you meet in three or four days when you get the answer to whatever, then you get together again. So well, and I think the Brattleboro uh, Select Board meets every week. Yeah, Burlington yeah. some sometimes does meet every week. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. It would make it more complicated for sure, but yeah. I just wonder if it... 
Well, it doesn't say that they can't be done before no. December right. 8th. I, I, I think this they is just have five. to be done by the, by, by the by the by by business days. By, you're right. By by. So just for clarification, Madam <clears throat> Chair, are we excluding holidays or including them? Excluding holidays. The way the definition, what I'm proposing here is that we do this and then we have people testify on but the definition that I found in here under the commerce and trade, and it's in a couple of different places, is a business day is any calendar day except Saturday, Sunday, or any day classified as a state holiday under 1 BSA 371. So sometimes there will be an extra day in there and sometimes not. I guess that's a compromise. I, I don't know that there's a perfect solution to it. I, I understand both sides, I really do. I, and I don't know that there's a perfect solution. I, I'm not willing to go any farther than that. Nor am I. No, I think this is a good compromise. I'm willing to support that. Okay, so. Let's, can we have that drafted and then, and then we'll put it on the agenda and get final comments on it just so that everybody knows. Claire, did you have? No. Can I ask you a little nitpicky question? Uh -oh. um, it's the, there's a list of definitions in the open meeting law and this would one through five and if it was, they're alphabetical right now, if you're gonna move it to be alphabetical to the top of the list, you have to renumber everything that follows, and then you'll have to change another law to not mess up the cross-reference, or I can just stick it at the bottom of the list and have it not be alphabetical. Do you stick have a preference, or are you completely indifferent? Okay, stick, stick it, it at, at the bottom. bottom. Have it not be alphabetical, yeah. okay. Or, or define it, use the term in such a way that it falls at the bottom of the alphabet. Well, then you do have to call it a zealously adhere to. And then have to uh, use word Zephyr is. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I don't think we want you to go through all that. No. Okay. Yeah. It would only be one other statute in, in Title 16 that would have to be fixed. But I checked. Whatever you think is the easiest and best way to do it. Okay. Uh, what is that? Um, okay. We'll leave it up to you. Stick it at the bottom of the list so nothing else has to change. It won't be alphabetical list anymore. We make too much about the alphabet anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Sue Grafton is the only one that really needs to pay attention to the alphabet. Well, another good one. <laughs> okay, we're going to take a little break here. We're a little few minutes over. We're supposed to start here at 3, but we're going to take a five minute break. We will be back in here by five minutes after 3. So we'll only I will, uh, once again, we're looking at campaign finance law, and I will once again my register my displeasure that we still do not have a report on the summer tour done by the Secretary of State and the Attorney General's office on campaign finance yeah. that was done yeah. and completed four meetings, and we still do not have a report. Why not? Is that from the AG's because, office or from yes. the Secretary of State? Well, the Secretary of State said he wasn't writing it. It was the AG's office that was writing it, and we've heard nothing, and I've written a letter of dismay to both of them and heard nothing back from either of them. I just thought I would get this on the record for anybody who cared, because I thought that if they did have, if any expectations were built up by people who attended those meetings, thinking they're that some of their ideas might be incorporated, we will not be able to incorporate them this year. So anything that happens will not be applicable until the election of 2020 cycle. So I just thought I would put that on the record. Yes? What if we ask them for the input they receive based on their tour? Don't ask for the report. I've Just asked them, e could they even give us an idea of what might be in there? And I've heard from neither of them. You're joking. That is unbelievable. Well, we do seem to have somebody here from the AG's office, so maybe she has brought with her a whole bunch of records. Oh, <laughs> slowly they I don't, <laughs> I don't think that we can put it on to her. I think that this was She's the, the AG himself. <laughs> He's, he, it was the AG himself and the Secretary of State himself that actually did the tour. So, so I just thought I'd get that off my chest. 
Betsy, would you like to tell us what we're doing in H828? Sure. For the record, Betsy Ann Rask, Legislative Council. As you can see from the title of this bill, it's an act relating to disclosures and campaign finance law. So it is focused on disclosures that have to be filed. Mm -hmm. and there's two main things going on in here. The first would be to add an additional report that local candidates have to file. That's just one part of this bill. And the other Sorry. part of, mm -hmm. yes. What do you mean local candidates? We're all local. It depends no, on like, how you define no, local it. candidates on, meaning state. on Not your statewide. town state. elections, your state. local elections. Oh, wow. Everybody from select board, town clerk. There's, a, there's statewide, there's Not general state. assembly, which are considered state, there's federal, and there's local. Got it. So they don't do this then? Okay. Yes. Four days. Let, let's Four just let Betsy walk us through it and tell us what changes are being attempted to be made here. All right. And the second issue that this addresses is essentially updating the definitions <laughs> of electioneering communication and mass media activity. You'll see the general theme is yeah. updating those definitions and how the identification in electioneering communications um, must be provided when we're talking about um, types of communications in social media and other electronic types of communications uh, to make it more up to today's uh, standards and ideas of the types of electioneering communications that can happen over things like social media and other forms of communication. So the first thing that you'll see this bill does on page one is amend the definition section. It starts out by amending the definition of what is an electioneering communication. You can see to review that definition, it's any communication that refers to a clearly identified candidate for office and either promotes or supports a candidate or attacks or opposes a candidate, <coughs> regardless of whether it, it expressly advocates um, a vote for or against the candidate. And then it says, including all of these different types of communications. So you've got newspaper publications um, or ads, um, radio, TV, or internet ads. Um, and then you can see at the very end, it says, or if it's contained in any direct mailing, robotic phone call, or right now it says, or mass email. So the first update would be to say, instead of just mass email, um, it would include mass electronic or digital communications to acknowledge more of today's technology. And just to remind, when we're talking about the definition of an electioneering communication, what that triggers is an identification requirement within the electioneering communication itself, like a paid for by identification, so that when a person sees an electioneering, electioneering communication, they know who paid for it. Who's trying to talk to me right now when they're having this ad placed in the newspaper or on social media? The second thing this does at the top of page two is to amend the definition of a mass media activity. And right now it's defined as a TV commercial, radio commercial, mass mailing, mass electronic or digital communication, and it would add in social media advertisement. So that social media ads would be considered a mass media activity. Under the campaign finance chapter, if there's a mass media activity, that is um, put out within, I believe it's 45 days, pardon me, I'll get to you, get you that section in a moment. If a person has a mass media activity um, totaling $500 or more within 45 days before a primary, general, county, or local election, it requires a mass media activity report that gets sent to the Secretary of State's office a copy of which also has to be sent to each candidate whose name or likeness is included in the mass media activity. Mm -hmm. Betsy, does this mean, I'm sorry, Chris, no, okay. um, that the mass media activity includes every candidate for every office? It has to include the name or likeness of a clearly identified candidate for office, I'm sorry. No, but I mean from the cemetery commissioner, if there was such a race, all the way to the governor. Yes because this addresses okay. all um, activities for all candidates. Um, and okay. that definition of local election 
Um, it is defined in our elections title as any election that deals with the selections of persons to fill public office or the settling of public questions within a single municipality. And it also, if it, a municipality covers multiple different municipalities that they all have to incur. So yes, if there's an election for a cemetery commissioner and somebody puts out a mass media activity worth at least 500 bucks, it they says, have to into that. okay, yeah, vote the 500 bucks. Yeah, yeah, I have a problem. Our cemetery commissioner is yeah, so it's real brutal, race. right? Yeah, it's brutal. It's brutal. Chris? How? I mean, I have reported Facebook ads already, so this me too. surprises me, and I guess I don't understand how anyone could think of a social media advertisement as anything other than mass electronic or digital communication. Isn't this needlessly redundant? It could be, and I because if you turn back to the front page, you see it just refers to mass electronic or digital communications. So is there some distinction there? Why isn't social media advertisement included there? Yeah, it would be, I think. I think it could be right. considered duplicative. It might be a reason um, to either remove it from mass media activity so that it doesn't raise a question of whether a social media advertisement um, no, it does it constitute an electioneering communication? Um, court may wonder. Well, I, I guess what I mean is, I think it's already in yes. both of these it's definitions. But, right. Yes, maybe it's not necessary there. Be probably good to hear from the Secretary of State's and um, AG's office on how they would interpret that. Why is there that distinction? Um, and to see if they think that it causes any confusion to have it in one place and not the other, and doesn't an electronic do it mass mail. Mass advertisement, um, digital communication, include a social media app. All right, those are the two de um, updates to those definitions. Um, then, on the, in the middle of page two, you can see there is the addition to the local candidate reporting schedule to add in a local candidate report four days before the local election. They already have to file reports 30 days before, 10 days before, and two weeks after the local election. This would add an additional requirement to do it four, to, uh, four days before. And you can see it's for those candidates for local office who have rolled over any amount of surplus into their new campaign, or if they've made expenditures or accepted contributions of $500 or more since the last local election. That's when they have to file these reports, and they would be required to file this additional report. What why? Yeah. What's what I, I don't think that Betsy really is the why. I think Betsy is the how. To, is she well, <laughs> she's telling us what the what they passed, but the why is for somebody else to defend. I know he's I mean, some of the conversation in committee was um, that local elections differ from the cemetery commissioner in a very small town to the city councilor in Burlington. Those are all local elections and part of the conversation was should some of these larger elections, I mean, should there, there be additional reporting um, to account for those. Um, sometimes local elections have big expenditures of money. It's like you're reporting, you're doing more reporting than you are campaigning here. Well, let's, let's leave the discussion of this to because we'll hear from testimony from people because I want Betsy to walk us through the bill as the bill is, but Just a yes, a technical question. Does this parallel what we do, state campaigns, I think? It's more it's similar, memory, but. I can tell you, um, your, for all legislative and state offices in the second year of the general election cycle, you have to report on March 15th, July 15th, August 15th, September 1st, October 1st, October 15th, and the Friday before the general election, and then two weeks after. Yeah. All right, at the bottom of page two, it gets into the statute that actually says what an identification requirement is. If you have an electioneering communication, if it meets that definition, here's what your identification has to be that's included in it. And it starts out by saying, an electioneering communication has to contain the name and mailing address of the person, candidate, pack, or party that paid for it. 
and the name and address have to appear prominently and in such a manner that a reasonable person could clearly understand by whom the expenditure was made with these couple exceptions. Right now, current law says if it's a radio electioneering communication, you don't have to have the address. The proposal here is to say any audio electioneering communication doesn't have to contain the address. What other audio? Robocall. That's on um, the radio. Yeah. Well, that's. Okay. Yeah, I never heard of yeah, oh, I, That's different. I didn't think of the phone. No, that's already. And I don't really, I don't have experience with these. Um, because I'm not in campaigns, so I, I mean, there's probably other people who would know more about the options are. <coughs> okay. You can see in sub two, just um, to review with you the current law, if the electionary communication is paid for by a person acting as an agent or consultant on behalf of somebody else, the electioneering communication has to clearly designate who's actually um, paying for it, on whose behalf is the pub communication published or broadcast. And then under B, if it's a related campaign expenditure, meaning it was uh, coordinated with the candidate, then it also has to clearly designate the candidate on whose behalf it was made by saying on behalf of such a black uh, candidate. Then there's in sub C, there's that <coughs> language that if it's an electioneering communication paid for or on behalf of a PAC or a party, it has to contain the name of any contributor who contributed more than 25% of all contributions and more than 2,000 bucks to that PAC or party since the beginning of the cycle. And then on page four in new D, it gets into this new language about how to meet the identification requirements of this section when the electioneering communication is a small text-based online electioneering communication. So it says in order to meet those identification requirements, the paid for by language, a small text-based online electioneering communication may, a discretionary may provide the required ID info by using an automatic display within the online communication that takes the reader directly to the required identification. So if it's so small, you can't fit in that paid for by language, you can use something like hyperlink to take you to where you can find the identification information to be able to meet the identification requirements. So it starts out in D1 by saying this display has to be clear and conspicuous, unavoidable, you can't miss it, immediately visible, remain visible for at least four seconds, and display a color contrast so as to be legible so you can see it. And then it gives examples in D2. It includes a non-blockable pop-up, a rollover, a separate text box or hyperlink that automatically appears with or in the online electioneering communication that automatically takes the reader to the required ID upon being clicked, and any other similar mechanism that provides the ID info required by this section. Why well, it's easier to just do newspapers. Right here. <laughs> hey, Chris. So uh, I want to go back up to D. <clears throat> A small text based online electioneering communication is an interesting delineation because most of your online electioneering communication that I've been involved in would not be text-based, it would be image-based. I had the same question. So did the House wrestle with that or did they, I mean, did they mean to exclude a Facebook ad, for instance? I don't know if they meant to exclude that they talked about what is it called the skyscrapers the very thin little ad yeah, the, at the top of the yeah. page yeah banners banner ads yeah banners yeah but those are te those are those are mostly image yeah. based I mean I would agree with Chris all so are you saying there's no text in those well they're not they're, they're they might be small I'm not sure how we find that and I don't think they're text based. They're, mm -hmm. They maybe have some text, but I would have said they were image based or graphic based. Yeah, I wouldn't say so, anything based. I would just say 
Well, let's, let's yeah, hear but from... I, so I just wondered if that Let's was... flag that and hear yeah. from people about what they think it means and how we got here. Okay. Something that's not purely audio, for example. Well, but, sure, but... but then well, just, yeah, gotcha. let's... That would just say space. small online communication. Gets me a lot no, so um, I don't want to... <laughs> But you still have to meet the definition of electioneering communication, so there's some it would. sort of... I, I don't want us no, to start okay. changing words now no, before we hear... I'm just sure we understand. The, just the, I know, but I don't want... Okay. We're, we're coming back to this, right? We're coming yeah. back to this. It is flagged, which is an image. I would just uh, direct you back to the definition of electioneering communication, that it has yeah. to... Uh, try to influence... Promote, sure, uh, sure. Yeah, promote. So just a face alone. Well, it's good to say about yeah. Pearson, but you know, if, if, we'll talk about it later. I, I just don't want. I don't think Betsy is the person to try to right. to well, defend to this. So. Yes, I want to hear why they did this and what it is, instead of trying to substitute language right now before we hear from everybody. Just a suggestion. Yeah, yeah, we hear. You know, it's flat. It's flat. And then the other last thing is just that it takes effect uh, at the beginning of our new two-year general election cycle, that odd date, December 14th of this year. Mm. Did you see D2 examples? Yes. Did you look at that? Mm -hmm. Yes. This is how you comply, right? That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Eleanor has her old draft report with an item 10. Eleanor, we have something here for you to take back to. to um, <laughs> yeah. to eat. Yes, you. we could not convince her to come, but. I couldn't convince her to come either. It's okay. Thank you. Sure. Did you give her chocolate cake or something? Did you give her? <laughs> not yet. Her last day is <coughs> on Thursday, so we're doing something. Oh, okay. Good. Uh, Eleanor Spotswood from the Attorney General's Office. Yeah. Um, Eleanor, you said that you had been working on this since 2013. Yes. Um, so, largely, the Attorney General's Office um, is okay with this bill. Uh, the committee has already noticed several questions that we have about it. Uh, let's see. So the, on page three, uh, the addition of the, the additional reporting requirement uh, being four days before the election. It's on our page two. Oh, uh, yeah. I must have the wrong draft. Uh, in any event, the addition of the uh, four days before reporting requirement um, for local elections, uh, you know, there is this constitutional sort of ceiling uh, that says reporting requirements can't be unduly burdensome. Um, and particularly given that it's a local election, I guess there, there might be a question of whether this is edging closer to unduly burdensome. I'm not sure that I would say that it actually is, um, but that is something to consider. Uh, and then the committee also, Madam Chair, sure. yeah. if we don't spend any money on a local election, we don't have to file anything. Is that correct? I mean, that's the way it always used to be in our little yeah. that's right there. I think okay. that's correct. Five hundred dollars. Yeah. So this only really affects people who spend money, which would over be over five hundred. Uh, over yeah, five hundred. Be quite a lot in Addison County, at any rate. Yeah. And then um, it's electronic. It's just, it would be the same site that we use, which for someone who hasn't ever filed a home pay report, it's pretty easy. <laughs> I believe, I don't have the statute in front of me. I believe it's uh, raising or spending $500. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, I don't think, oh, there it is. Um, and then the other thing we've noted is um, what the committee has already discussed, which is, um, how to define a small text-based online mm -hmm. communication. Yeah. Um, that language seems potentially somewhat vague to us um, and therefore potentially hard to enforce. Um, otherwise, our office is 
fairly neutral on this bill. So what would the AG after their tour consider uh, and adding to this bill and what, what, what are the priorities that you have for uh, uh, reforming or improving campaign finance? I am afraid I'm not prepared to answer that question. Too bad. We were hoping you'd be the carrier, the messenger. I apologize. I can certainly convey your concerns to the general. Yeah, I mean, here we are. We have a vehicle for this, and we haven't had one proposal. We could give her a little paper shield that she could ride on. <laughs> she could take Clementine to toss it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. No further questions? Thank you. Uh, Josh? Yes. Eleanor. Yes. Why? So my name is Josh Ronsky. Um, you don't, we'll introduce okay. yourselves because you're relatively new to the committee yes. and probably first not time. know anybody. So I'm Jeanette White from Wyndham County. Brian Collimore from Rutland County. Claire Air, Addison County, Huntington Appeal Score. I know Josh well, but Chris Pearson. <laughs> well, Prods, you got to I met Josh for the first time today. Yeah. It's good to see you, Allison Parks and Windsor County. He also lives in my neighborhood. He does. Mm -hmm. So he was a constituent twice over in the house and in the summer. That's right. So uh, my name is Josh Ronson. I'm the executive director of the Progressive Party, and I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to testify mm -hmm. on H E 28. Um, in general, our position is that it's, it's a fine bill. Um, I don't have too much more to say on the social media uh, reporting aspect of the bill. Um, generally, we're pretty supportive of that. It's not, I don't see that as onerous um, to candidates at all. In fact, I think it actually adds, makes it a little bit easier um, for candidates to report in some situations. Um, the main thing I'm interested in is the local, um, reporting the addition of a local reporting date for campaign finance and I'm especially interested in this because we've seen in some areas of the state a lot of money being raised and spent in that period between the final reporting date and the local the, the actual election um, in small towns this isn't really an issue um, but you could also make the argument that in many small towns you're not hitting the $500 threshold to qualify for reporting anyway. Um, so really this would apply to people who are raising over that $500 amount. And you know, just to kind of give you some numbers, I went through campaign finance reports um, for the last two elections and I looked at this in Burlington, which of course is a very specific example, um, but it is also an important one. And I think one of the reasons we're, we're pretty supportive of this language. And just on the council level in the last election, um, People, council candidates raised $11,000 in the period between the final reporting deadline and the actual election. Um, so that's that's a whole bit of money, and that's just on the council level. On the um, did, did they raise that total, or did they raise total. that each? That's that's total. So each range from um, eight. Yeah. So each candidate, it was a range of um, Two thousand one hundred fifty-five dollars and twelve cents to to zero. One candidate did not raise any money, um, but that's and that's in that window between the the ten day the, window. the, the ten day window. Yeah, um, and then on the mayoral level, um, the mayoral candidates raised um, thirty-two thousand one hundred and ten dollars um, in that in that ten day window and spent um, twenty spent. $57,760.11 in that 10, and that was split up three ways. Um, they sorry, the, the total they spent was how much? They spent 57000 almost 58000 um, So it's quite a bit of money, and a lot, you know, you are seeing a lot of $1,000 checks, and I, I kind of wonder if people might be holding some checks or encouraging people to donate on the on, on day nine rather than on day 11 before the election, if there's some money in there that they would rather not be public before the election. Um, they should get thousand dollar checks running for mayor. Oh yeah, and city council, yeah. Just in Burlington. In Burlington, I, I, even looked, I don't know if that's also the case really? for Winooski, yeah. Um, you know, and just, I also looked at 2017. Um, in 2017 elections, they were, 
Um, it was district level races, so it's it's bigger seats in Burlington, and there were people raising four or five four or five thousand dollars in the period between the the ten day window and the actual election. Um, so it is a pretty I mean it is a pretty significant amount of money that that is not being reported, and I'm sure many people I mean the whole point of this is to seek transparency in our elections and. Um, I think people would be interested in in seeing where some of that money is being, how much money is being spent and raised, and who's raising that money um, before the actual election is over. Because it's it's always interesting seeing um, on the final reports on March 20th what what money was raised after the final reporting deadline. Um, and just the one the one thing I would say, um, so we we are very supportive of that that piece, and if. So you're supportive of the burdens in four days. Yes, the board, the burdens in four days. Yes, um, but you know I would argue that if you're raising, you know, ten thousand dollars for a city council race or five, even five, six thousand for a city council race, it's probably not. You can probably put that into a extra campaign finance report. Um, and just you know the the one last piece I would say I believe there's a provision in the statewide law that says if you raise, even in that three-day window, if you raise over a certain amount from a single donor, you'd have to do an extra report, and I would support that being included as well if folks were interested um, in, in strengthening this even further. What, what amount would you put on that um, I would, you know, I would even just look at, I'm not sure what the amount is on the, for the statewide level, but I would just look at that and just apply it exactly. Yeah, I don't think it's onerous, and I don't think if you're a small town, select board member raising 300 bucks, which is the vast majority of people running, this isn't gonna to apply to you anyway. This is really, and if you're raising all that much money, then you can probably, you probably have an infrastructure. To so, do. you know, given how incredibly varied mm -hmm. the scale is of these elections, I mean, we, you know, Burlington is really running, people are spending what they spend to run for the house, and for some people more than they run, oh. spend running for the Senate. So, um, it strikes me that there ought to be two different standards. I mean, for what you spend, I don't know anybody who spends anything in much in our neck of the woods, maybe in Hartford, maybe in Springfield, but it strikes me that there really ought to be almost like a different standard for towns over 8,000 people, and we could come up with a, 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 a whatever. But also, I have forgotten what our spending limits are. What are the- There are no spending limits. I mean, not spending limits. What What are the contribution limits? Fifteen hundred for 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 the house. Senate. No, no. For can we get local? It's the same as the house. It's the same as the house. For all no. local elections, yeah, it's my, the same as the my house. My understanding is there was a um, thought that you couldn't go much lower without running into constitutional questions around um, putting too onerous of a limit. It just says over five hundred dollars. Yes. If you've raised or spent over 500, I, so. I, I realize I was just that. asking what the contribution limit is. Well, I understand that. It's $1,000. It's $1,000. Yeah. I House. guess I'm saying there is two systems. In a small race, you won't have raised or spent 500. You don't have to report anything. No, I, I realize that. Should we make it higher than 500? Yeah. I mean, because you're talking about races where they're spending thousands. And. Maybe it would be more appropriate if, it, if we raised it to a thousand dollars. I mean, that's just well, something. Well, let's talk about that. Yeah. So I guess that's my question. Maybe we can. Okay. Yeah. Any more I, questions I, for Josh? Yes. How long have you been the executive director of the Progressive Party? It'll be two years in May. So in May, I'll have been through a whole two-year cycle. Wow. Mm -hmm. yes. Great. Nice to have you. Uh, just to follow up on the one uh, statute that Mr. Ronsky mentioned, it's 17 BSA section 2967 that provides for state and legislative candidates if within 10 days before a primary or general election, um, a candidate accepts a monetary contribution in an amount over $2,000, they have to file an additional report within 24 hours. But that only applies so to state, state and law. legislative. That, that, that's only the statewide because no one right. else can raise that money. Right. And then we have a limit of 1500 That's right. Mm -hmm. But party contributions are. Oh, right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks. Appreciate that. Brandy? And we 
Well, I need to introduce myself. I mean, I have everybody introduce myself. I know everybody. Yeah. I will introduce you myself. You heard us when we did it before. I We're did. not going to repeat it. Yes. Uh, for the record, Brandon Batham. I am the political director of the Vermont Democratic Party. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, similar to uh, to Josh, we really don't have any issues with this bill. Um, you know, I think in general, uh, the more disclosure we can see, especially in local politics, the better. Um, there are we have again similar questions to some of the uh, social media stuff um, and and some of the electioneering communications. Um, so I'll just start out. I think where we where we start out with with respect to social media. Um, for, the, for, for some of you who may not be familiar, may not do digital advertising uh, or social media advertising, there are certain vendors that restrict uh, the amount of text that you can place in a paid uh, or sponsored advertisement. Um, that would certainly be a concern for us. We do have many candidates who, who already rely pretty heavily on text in some of their images and some who may just be skirting the line, and, and Facebook in particular is, is very strict about the amount of text that they'll allow on a sponsored ad. So if somebody wants to, say, uh, just have a graphic that's a you know, basic background color and a list of endorsements, um, you know, they, they may have to shrink the text size. They have, to, they have to toy around with some of the different settings to be within the parameters of what Facebook allows as as a, a, a sponsored ad that they're happy to put up. They've been trying to steer away from, from text-based uh, sponsored ads as much as possible. Again, you know, if we're, if we're talking about a way to make a disclosure clear and identifiable, that's definitely something to, to think about. Um, and, and how big do you want it to be? How much of the ad space can it really take up? And if there is already text in that ad, would you, you know, with this requirement, would you then be making it potentially not a viable option for somebody to put to Facebook and say, I want to sponsor this ad? Um, with respect to electioneering communications, we do a lot of work uh, outside of election years. Um, and particularly issues based, but and, and obviously during the legislative session, um, uh, that largely is specific to thank House Democrats or thank Senate Democrats to, to try to promote uh, some of the uh, some of the legislative uh, things happening in, in both chambers and from time to time they include a picture or, or something of an individual member or mention an individual member. Uh, with that, would that fall under the standard of promoting or supporting an, an identified candidate for office? And again, depending on 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 when you know, if if, if they're if they're a former candidate or they're or they're in the campaign finance system, does that classify? Um, you know, we, that's certainly a question that we want to be clear on with respect to legislative intent and wanting to make sure that the work that we do outside of elections that we know how to proceed. What was your question? May I ask a question? I'm sorry. No, please do. Um, it is argued that there is no bad press, that all press is good press, and that that there are many things that promote uh, and support candidates that candidates have no control over. The press, for example, does a lot of that. Um, and so that is, uh, you know, that's an interesting question because, uh, you know, but this is the party doing it. Doesn't say that. Yeah. He's yeah. he just said it's the party. No, I know, but I'm just and I'm curious beyond the party. You're right. I I, I hear that question about the party, but that's a sort of question just generally, which is it, it would be impossible to get a, a, the amount of press that promotes and well, and and, and, and we are candidates. I, yeah, we took it oh, up. we did. We took it up. Okay. Well, and as an example, um, you know, we had the uh, the march for our lives uh, this weekend, and the party participated and had a, you know, we did voter registration, and we did other work. Um, if we had shared on social media, uh, say, a picture where you could see Speaker Missy Johnson. Um, in, we in took the a corner. picture of all the exactly. legislators that lived there. If we had, if we had shared that picture. And, and sponsored that as a, as a post on our social media. Um, it's a clearly identified candidate for, for, um, 
for public office. You know, the question I guess would be what, how could, you know, it might limit our ability in terms of how we're framing the content that we're presenting. We'd have to be very careful not to say thank you, Speaker Johnson, or thank you so and so for, for being here. Um, I think that would, that's a question that we definitely would like to see answered. Or clarified. Or clarified. And, and, and again, it's, for us, it is relatively easy to remain in compliance with the standards as they exist right now. And I don't know that we have, a, have an opinion one way or another, but it would be probably helpful for us and, and I would imagine the other major parties um, if that was clarified. Chris, did you have a question? No. Oh, Claire, Claire. Claire. I'm sorry. I wondered, you, you, you said you wondered something about four former candidates and I missed the first part of the sentence. Yeah, so the, the, the concept of what, you know, what would formally classify a candidate for the current election cycle. You know, if, if, uh, if we had put, a, if, if, you, if, if we decided we wanted to promote uh, something for you, um, or we wanted to, you know, say, to highlight some work that was going through the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. Um, if we did that and you chose not to run uh, in, a, in the following election year, would you formally be a candidate? Um, you know, again, a lot of this is is limited would you have to, to mean, the. Would you have to declare that stuff? Exactly. Are, are candidates declared when they file with the Secretary of State? Yes. Are candidates? Uh, are, if, if 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 a candidate doesn't file with the Secretary of State, doesn't raise that five hundred or spend that five hundred dollars or more, is are they a candidate when their petition is submitted? And so for us, it, it, that might turn into a logistical headache of trying to determine what identifying a candidate is. And we do do regular uh, activities and, and social media and promotion of, of particularly our policy during the, the, the legislative session that this would affect. I think Chris had a question. I don't understand. It was why advocating it's so Chris Frank Clair. I don't understand why it would be complicated. Aren't don't we have to? Submit our name to the Secretary of State or some such thing after we, we handed the petition. They said the petition's okay, and then you sign something and you're a candidate, whatever that thing could be. A candidate before that, under candidate mm -hmm. bias laws. If you declare you're a candidate and you've raised and spent or you four, if you spend more than $500, mm -hmm. or four raise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. but, yeah. But historically, the promotes or supports a candidate for office has been pretty, as my understanding is, it's interpreted as vote for Claire Air. Mm -hmm. That's a lot different from, hey, check out Claire Air's bill on X. Yeah. And, and I, I don't think yeah. anything here is changing that, but yeah. but that's something we need to look at. Yeah. We, and, and I think that's that's the really issue. And when I, when I, when I and I'm sure the rest of our, our staff think of what supporting or promoting or attacking or opposing a candidate is, we think of that in the terms of vote for. But we, again, we do a lot of this work, so we just want to be really, really clear. And we do a lot of it on social media and email. So Betsy Ann raised the question that it, one of the reasons this is important for transparency is to see who paid for it. You said that to us just a few minutes ago in adding these words electronic or digital communications. Well, quite honestly, some of it you don't pay for. If you did use Facebook to it, without buying an ad, but just posted stuff, vote for, you're not paying for it. And, and that's another good question. And I mean, I, you know, and, and meaning no disrespect to any of the other political parties, but, and I, I don't know what their numbers would be, but our social media following numbers are substantial. And potentially up in in what a first time candidate might be paying to have this a similar or even fraction of the audience that we have. So you know, then a question would be if if you've got with respect to the parties regular social media presence, um, how do you regulate that? Do you say in you know in in the social media profile that that there be a requirement? Um, that it be clear that, 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 that the account is managed and paid for by the Vermont Democratic Party or by uh, whatever. Um, because we do, we, you know, we, we do sponsor ads, but uh, the bulk of our social media presence is not paid. Right, exactly. Well, the paying has always been the delineation, as I understand it, but help me understand this because I've done a lot of ad buys through Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. Um, 
But a lot of where I've spent money on Facebook is not in an ad the way you think of it, you know, click here for Joe's Plumbing or whatever, but in a so-called promoted post. So uh -huh. if I'm having an event, I would create an event. That's a free thing. I set up that little thing. And then you can put some money behind it. But in that case, you don't have the ability to manipulate the ad in any way. Mm -hmm. You could just, or even even if I got a, an endorsement, let's, I've never had this, but let's say an newspaper <laughs> endorsed me. You've had and, you've never had an endorsement. And so that, that's a news story which I would share. And then you could put some money to push, push that out. Mm -hmm. But I can't manipulate that post. And that, that worries me when I think about this because while it seems really straightforward, the mechanics of Facebook might be limiting. I don't know if you've thought through that. Yeah, it's, it's uh, and, 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 I, and I guess it would be a good transition to another concern. And we don't, uh, the Vermont Democratic Party doesn't uh, have a large, uh, doesn't have a long experience of working with digital advertisements. When we think about digital advertisements, we think about, you know, Facebook and social media and Twitter and YouTube because it's kind of what, what even some of the, the candidates who are starting to use digital advertising in Vermont are using. Um, there is a whole another world of digital advertising vendors and, and um, content creators um, that partner with websites. If I go to the Times Argus uh, website uh, and I wanted to work with a vendor who, who purchased an ad on, and, and, and ad space and advertised in that space, um, the chances are similar to being able to determine what the final product would be with a Facebook ad, I, there are some cases where there is even less ability to do so with some digital vendors. You may give them, you know, I want it to be like this, I want it to include this picture, but in terms of mandating, say, if I, if I scroll over with a mouse on a pop-up ad and, and there's another text box that pops up and says, this has been paid for by something, something. Um, Chances are, you know, uh, there's going to be very little ability on behalf of individual candidates and the organizations to determine uh, the final product. So that's, you know, it's, it, it would be, to say it would be a learning curve for the, for, the, for the bulk of candidates, and it would certainly be a little less steep of a learning curve for us, but to say it would be a learning curve might be an understatement. Um, it definitely is, is going to require uh, uh, an at attention to detail and level of detail and follow through with vendors and, and social media uh, ad purchasers that, you know, we talk about, you know, how, how, you know, how most candidates can't raise a certain amount of money, you know, uh, it, it might be challenging. I think I'm, my tendency on this bill, if I'm to, we're going to hear from Dan next, my tendency on this bill is going to be to support the for additional reporting period and leave the rest up to people who un understand what we're even talking about because I don't even know. I could do a little oh. walk through the screen. No, I don't want it. <laughs> Any more than I want to understand what blockchain means. I'm going to do my newspaper and I'm going to do whatever. But I, I, I really, I can't. I, I have no ability no, to weigh it, in on this. It's not easy. It's, stuff it's, even raise but, okay. questions for me. But a picture's worth a thousand words, and I think I can show you just easily. No, I, I don't even know what he's talking about when he's talking about content something yeah. or others and vendors and uh, so, I, so I'm going to I'm going to leave like, the yeah. the decisions about how to word this in a to make it as tight yeah. as possible up to people who understand it. That it sounds like a wise choice, man. I, I I will. Conduct the meetings. That might be a little <laughs> dangerous. No, well, because it, it, I think there are people who understand. Yeah, no, I, I'm beginning to understand because I just this was the first election I actually used all this mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, and I never used any of it. Yeah. Well, Chris and I did. <laughs> so, so yeah, so the, the parties, and I'm sure Vperg understands it, and I'm sure there are other people in our, in our. What? Yeah. What I need to understand, understand is is this even possible? I, I'm not convinced it is, but okay. it's a good goal. Yeah, it, yeah. I mean, so, if we have a requirement that effectively you can't do on Facebook, then you can't do Facebook ads in that. 
is a choice we better make consciously. Yeah. Which yeah. is a bad choice. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's why I said I'm gonna I think that there are people who understand it who will be able to contribute. And just a final note on the um, on the addition of a, of a reporting period for local yeah. candidates, it's one piece that I don't think we got to. Um, I, I, I would I would certainly push back against um, some of the you know some of the thought of well do we want to is this too onerous on local candidates? Money is coming into local races, and it's not just in Burlington and Winooski and Chittenden County. Uh, I, I ran for the city council in Barrie last year, and I raised $2,500, which I understand is more than potentially even some senators raise for their reelections, and and, uh, and is more than most House members have reported raising. You know, it's not. You know, it. it, it you know, I think. Um, did you get elected? I did. Um, Congratulations. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you. Yeah. Um, no, but I, uh, I, I will say that, that you know, and, and I, I certainly didn't take in any money toward the end. The bulk of my money was early raised, but, but um, and, and, and I did take a $1,000 check uh, from an individual. Um, so so it, it really is not uncommon, whether we're talking about the mayoral race in Burlington or the city council races in Winooski in Burlington or Barrie. Um, you know, money is starting to trickle into these communities, um, and and uh, what I would suggest, if 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 you were to do anything, uh, changing that threshold of which and basing it on, on population town uh, population by town, um, I would actually argue that it might be better to to lower that threshold, uh, so that uh, you know if, if if we're thinking that the majority. Of towns and, and candidates in small towns are not spending money, um, lowering that threshold as opposed to potentially five, doubling it from five hundred dollars. Uh, you know, again, it's you know, we it's it, it's really up to this committee's discretion. But like we said, more disclosure is better, and it and it does happen. You know, and, and it is going to continue to happen. And, and you know, there are people who aren't here at this table, or will never even be in this state, who operate on a national level to try to get people elected, both you know, from city council and select yes. board, all the way up to the governor's race. Yeah, we certainly say that. Yeah. Is, is the five hundred the same for everybody, not just local a requirement to report? Yeah, it is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. So for local, it might be that it should be. Lower. I think for local it should be. Uh, well, why would you make it? This is the threshold yes. at which you have to report. That's what this threshold is. Right. If you if you raise or spend five hundred dollars, you have to then file a report. If you do less, you don't have to. So if we raise that to a thousand dollars, then anybody raise that, that would cover ninety percent of the towns in Vermont. Would, would not have to report. Uh, you know, I don't. I yeah, I don't think it would be. Why? Bad, but why would we raise it for them and not for us? We have raised it for no, us. No, we haven't. It's five hundred dollars. If you make. Oh, I see. That this reporting is for everybody. I'm happy to keep it for everybody. I was just trying to figure out a way to differentiate between towns of eight thousand and and towns of seven hundred. But if you no, don't, I if you're think. in a town of seven hundred, chances are you're not going to spend five hundred dollars. Yeah, probably. Not. Okay. So I would keep it at five hundred dollars, and make it the same for everybody then, and not lower. It is. It is five hundred right. for everybody. Just saying. But Brandon just suggested we think about lowering it. Well, if I would say, if you're going to do anything to it, yeah. That it would be more transparent yes. in local elections if you lower yeah. it. And the thing to and the thing to keep in mind that that I think differentiates town meeting day elections from legislative elections or really any other election that takes place in August or November um, is that these elections are hyper concentrated into thirty and sometimes yeah. Yeah. at most well, sixty yeah. days. Yeah. Six um, weeks. I mean, you have to declare your. Candidacy six weeks before, yeah. and Burlington, uh, Burlington being the only municipality with partisan elect, uh, partisan right. uh, local races, um, has a little bit of a longer time between their their party caucuses to nominate for these roles or these offices. But um, yeah, you know, in in terms of providing, if 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 the goal is to provide right. as much transparency with the local elections, with the basic understanding that money is is starting to creep into local elections. 
um, then you know one of the key things to remember is that it is such a short election. Five hundred dollars over the course of six months. Uh, if it can't six weeks. Or, no, I'm talking about for 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 a regular for for legislative yeah. and, and statewide candidates. You know that's you know that seems like a totally reasonable uh, level. But if we're if we're keeping it limited to sixty or you know, six weeks, um, you know that's it's a, they're very different worlds, very different types of campaigns, very types big different types of elections, and again they are changing and they're going to continue to change and, and what what you could do here uh, may set the tone for transparency and more transparency in local elections. So can I ask you, um, Josh had uh, suggested that if that you do. Uh, because we have this um, issue around a single money coming from a single entity, if it's over the two thousand dollars, that that has to be specially reported. And he suggested that we might apply that also to local elections. Would you think agree that that's a when you idea to when, and and that that is that is limited to if an individual or yeah. organization contributes an, an entity an entity yeah so I mean. An entity right now, uh, with the exception of political parties, cannot give more than a thousand dollars to these local candidates. Right. So you would limit. I mean, you would put it at a thousand. You wouldn't put it at two. But you yeah, would yeah. Have the same concept. I, 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 again, I think, I think it. There are. I would imagine outside of of uh, some of the larger races in Burlington, like the mayoral race and some of the top tier city council races. Within that last final stretch of days, it shouldn't be too burdensome. I, it, you know, I would imagine you'd have maybe a handful of situations where that would apply for town meeting day elections, even over the next couple of years. Um, I can see the grand juror. And, and, and I, the only thing I would I would want to know with respect to that is again in the one city where we do have partisan elected uh, local offices. We, you know, I think we, the party, would want to be very clear about what constitutes um, our involvement and, and, and or a contribution. Um, you know, if, if the Progressive Party or the Democratic Party or the Republican Party in Burlington um, started uh, a, a massive social media purchase for, for a slate of candidates, you know, we, I guess we just, we would want to be very clear again how how this might affect our ability to work with, again, just one municipality. Any more questions for Brandon? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I was going to call on Dan next, but he just left. I was uh, actually going to take this one oh, anyway. Okay. Madam Chair, if that's okay with you. Uh, <coughs> you got your name tag. All those are good. <laughs> Do we, uh, are the Republicans going to? For the record, my name is Paul Burns. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Public Interest Research Group, VPER. Um, I wanted to testify today on this since we're dealing with a section of law and um, a set of uh, proposals that VPER has a fairly long history on. And, uh, I've had the opportunity to work with you uh, as a committee uh, in the past year, so I um, appreciate the opportunity. Um, I think it's important from our perspective to um, recognize that there is one aspect here of um, House uh, Bill 828 that actually would reduce at least some level of transparency, and that is because if we were to move to um, let's say a hyperlink on some of these kinds of ads that you've been discussing, that would actually be less information in the ad itself than would currently be required under existing law because as Betsy Ann uh, noted in walking through the bill, the, this already applies to uh, electioneering communication made over the internet. So that would include for instance, Facebook. Uh, that means that in Facebook ads today, one is supposed to say this is paid for by thus and so, a candidate or a, a PAC or what have you. Um, so it would be less disclosure, less transparency to go to something that it was uh, a, a hyperlink or one of the other uh, various means of you know, click here and find out more information. And so that's a concern for us, if I'm understanding it correctly, because 
I think fewer people will take advantage of the opportunity to click on something and go to another page and try to find that out. Some will, um, but, but my suspicion is that not as many as who would simply look at the ad and see that language, if that language appeared. So then the question comes, well, is it possible to have that language included in, say, a Facebook ad? And here we've got some interesting information that um, should be instructive because it was just in mid-December that the Federal Elections uh, uh, Communi uh, Commission, uh, FEC, um, issued a, uh, an opinion on this. Um, and they said that uh, Facebook ads are covered under existing law under the various requirements that it would apply to newspaper, television ad, radio, and so forth. And they said Facebook is included in here. And there had been some question about that in the past. And in fact, there had even been a previous decision from, I think, uh, 2011 when Facebook ads were different. They called them more thumbnail size. Um, uh, and uh, you didn't have as much room. Now, I'm not saying that the room is... Uh, is endless, but according, uh, if I may read just a short bit from the FEC opinion, they say, although Facebook ad guidelines warn that image ads with text overlaying more than 20% of the image, quote, will be shown to fewer people, Facebook excludes the overlay of, quote, legal text from this restriction because the text characters of a disclaimer required by law, this being the federal law that requires the paid for by, it says Facebook, um, it does not appear that the Facebook imposes any restrictions on that kind of disclosure requirement. So whatever Facebook says that they will require or, or, or allow or not allow would appear not to apply to anything. I suspect the same would be true of your state law as would uh, apply to a federal law. It says if you must disclose this as part of a political ad, they have to allow that. If I'm reading this correctly, the FEC decision from December 14th. There's more, uh, I think, useful information here, but in the end, it, it basically says um, the commission concludes that there is no physical or technological limitations of either display medium or internet technology that would make it inherently impracticable to include a disclaimer on proposed Facebook ads. Uh, so that just brings me back to my initial take here, which is that to move away from what I think is an existing requirement in Vermont to something that would have uh, less immediate disclosure, hyperlink or whatever, um, we're concerned about that. There may be certain kinds of um, ads or mediums uh, where, where you really don't have that kind of space. Um, and the FEC has included examples, uh, you know, the, on a, a advertisement on a pen or sky writing, or, you know, there are a few uh, examples, uh, apparel um, of certain types, where they don't require that kind of disclosure. But they've never... Uh, given an exemption for this kind of disclosure on electronic communications of this sort, um, according to this decision. So, so that's a concern that we have for any of this stuff. Now, we may find, or you may find, in further digging in. I must say, I wasn't, uh, I did not participate in the consideration of this over in the House side. I, I missed that opportunity. That's my fault. Uh, so they may have gone through some of this, but I'd be interested in uh, either Dan or myself trying to participate in this and and learn more about it, but that when I saw that and how it seemed to be in conflict with the direction of the, the FEC at this point, which is uh, you know, not necessarily the greatest defender of transparency in the world, uh, it seemed like we might be going in, in not the right direction on certain aspects of this. Um, I had some uh, questions about some of the language, uh, but it's basically been flagged by others uh, for the most part. Uh, what would a small text-based uh, um, online electioneering communication be? What would the definition of small uh, be, for instance? Um, there, are, there are some questions uh, uh, that we had about that, and, and if it's text-based, does that mean strictly text or, or image? You know, images are included in almost all of these things, at least to some extent um, these days. These had some um, question under um, just under that where it's describing the examples of the permissible uh, automatic displays, um, something that would appear with or in the electronic um, uh, or the online electioneering communication. I wasn't sure what with or in the electronic communication uh, might mean the with there, I guess, in particular. So um, those are uh, not nitpicky, but just really trying to, I know how important it is to really figure out what, the, what these definitions mean and if they are going to apply to, to these ads 
you and your colleagues are going to want to know um, what, what does it mean for them. And so we're happy to try to participate in that process, um, but those were some of the things that we had flagged in the initial read-through uh, of, the, of the bill. Well, and actually, quite honestly, that's, I, I would really love to have a visual for understanding what that would mean, because I have a notion, but not that I would really need to see a visual um, illustration of what applied and then unapplied, you know, what this would mean and what it would not, you know, what it was before and what it, who, did anyone know who brought this bill? Who, whose bill was this and why is, why are we considering this? What was the impetus behind the bill? And there, for two questions I have, which is the, 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 the oh, sorry, I'm sorry, 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 sorry. I think you know, if, if uh, I'm, my pages may not line up as well, but I think there are some question about the, the um, what came up earlier about the definition of mass media activity versus uh, electioneering communication and are we intentionally including different right. items under each of those it, as a means of saying, well, we clearly don't want it to apply to X in the other definition. I think it's probably worth exploring a little right. bit more. The, whether it should, it belongs in no places or both places. Uh, are yeah. that, or else you need some rationale for not right. having right. it be in one yeah. versus the other, yeah. I think. Is there something in campaign finance disclosure or campaign finance that you think we should be addressing that we aren't? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we, um, the short answer is yes, and we have testified many times to certain things that we would love to see in campaign finance law. I know that one of the areas that the um, that I believe that the Attorney General um, and the Secretary of State were looking at, for instance, had to do with public financing of elections. Um, you, Senator, are well aware that there are uh, a great number of restrictions now placed on what you all can do um, in terms of you know, regulating the elections process. And while that's true, there are some things that can be done, and we think in order to try to limit the influence of money in the process, if we could make it possible to have a more robust public financing system here, that that is definitely worth exploring. Um, even short of a, of a broader view, and this is something that the Secretary of State had, had mentioned in the last session, that he had hopes to come back with a, um, uh, some ideas about how that uh, system could be expanded and improved. Even short of that, there were some challenges uh, made clear in the last uh, legislative session to the, public, to the existing public financing law that we had hoped to change, and that had to do with when a candidate can declare or receive initial funds if qualifying for public financing because today it's mid-February and that may be well after the date that uh, opponents would have declared and, and started to run their campaign as an example. Um, so there were there are some specific things like that that we had noted. Another was, uh, frankly, that it, it appears that it is possible today for a candidate to um, declare an interest in public financing, seek the qualifying contributions for public financing, but in the meantime, raise funds just uh, from private donors, just as anybody else can, um, of $1,500, well, of $2,000, because it only applies to the statewide, several statewide races now. Uh, and then once qualifying, you would go back to re using the public financing, but you would already have spent a, perhaps a great deal of private financing up to the I amount. Thought we, I thought we dealt with that. Did we deal we with talked this? About it. You did. We, in we the had a quite robust conversation about public financing earlier this year. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this, not, this yeah. was one of those things that we had hoped to, to fix. It was a fixable small piece, uh, but it didn't get all the way through <coughs> last time. Did, did we do it here, or did we not, as 
I think last year when we were doing the shared think you sent expenses, but we, we did it dealt a little bit with the shared expenses, but then this in the last couple of weeks we actually had a quite but not about that. Not about that. Not about that not. piece. But could we add that small piece that you were going to well, add? Yeah. I don't think that's a small piece. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a very complicated. You'll never know. Well, let's. Yeah. What, where were? Where did we end last year on that issue? I thought we ended that you could you couldn't do this double dipping, and that. Um, if you anything you did would be then subtracted from what you got from public financing, I thought that's where we ended and sent it to the house. Did we not end there? Let me find out where that I, went. So you think there's a piece that's in the house already? Well, I I we had a long conversation well, about it. We did. I thought we did. We did. The S44 was here. Yes, here. Well, we're going to add thing. S44 to this. Well, we did. We, we made S44 oh, yeah. law. law. S44. Oh, that's right. That's right. But that, in that, right. maybe we. That? But I think we debated adding it to that and then didn't in it the didn't. end. It didn't. That's my memory. That but I. But I. I so, yeah. it's a generic question, what? not necessarily for Paul, but he might have an opinion. My sister called me this morning. She was practically foaming over the phone. She was so ticked off. She had read on Facebook that a bunch of us are depriving Vermonters of generic drugs by what? arrogant mm -hmm. actions. It's the drug importing bill. Yeah. And she said, that's you they're talking about, you know. So if it were me, they were talking about Claire Ayers taking away your generic drugs. Is that a campaign expense? What do you mean, by who? Is it, it well, it was the Pharmacists of America who happened to be um, no. funded by the uh -huh. big pharma. Yeah. But if we're against one candidate, it's that doesn't not, You're include, not a candidate. You're you're else. Yeah. Well, as soon as I spend some money, then I'll be a candidate. Oh, you have money. Right? Well, I have money. Yeah. So you're yeah. Still would be, it's a question of whether it uses this express language of to, to vote for or against. That Does would it say probably be an issue based. Vote against? What else? She didn't declare. I haven't seen it before. Oh, thank you. Okay. It has to be like Claire's taking away your generic prescriptions. Don't vote for her. Right. Or vote her out of office or something that relates to the election. Promoting an action is, is for or against you. Yeah, your public, your really? record as a senator is. It doesn't have to have the magic words, but I don't it's think meant so. to yeah. influence the election so that people oh, don't that vote right? for you. If they're saying that Senator Ayer is taking my generic drugs from Vermonters, I would. Well, sounds more like lobbying. Yeah. Yes. You could. There, there was the case, a couple of cases in 2010, for instance, um, against both candidate Doobie and candidate Shumlin, and I think both the Republicans and the Democrats were found to have been electioneering when they were claiming that they were running issue-based ads. So that does come close, Senator, to, uh, perhaps to what you're describing. So it's so that's that's right. Don't I'm not saying it happened. Right. I just sort of she told me that. And I just thought, what that would be? Hmm. So Betsy, would you just check and see where we landed last year on yeah. that question about hmm. the double dipping? Because I know we had a really long oh, conversation, yeah. and that's that. What you're about. referring to as double dipping is the ability to raise private monies even yes. though you've applied for public financing. Mm -hmm. No, before you apply. So you did In the have process. Yeah. 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 an S44 draft. I'm pulling up your former drafts of S44. That was a shared candidate expenditures. It was in draft 2.2. Yeah, we... By the time we... of draft 3.1, it was no longer in there. So I think as Senator Pearson was describing, that we just we were going to pursue it, but then I'm not sure what happened. He didn't, and we just it. abandoned the whole idea. Well, partly because you were waiting on the proposals from the secretary. I'm now I'm yeah, from the, the secretary, AG and of state secretary of state. To say we're going to have this overall proposal. Let's not chip away at public financing. Yes. Let's yeah, that's right. Let's just sort of wait for the attorney. General. So yeah. we've been waiting for <laughs> the attorney general and the state secretary Here. of state. <laughs> Since last year, and it's the AG's office that brought charges and then later dismissed charges right. about that right. were related to campaign to public funding. Yeah. Right. Well, with uh, Dean Corn. Was, was, so corn. corn. There was yeah. a corn. Yeah. We did. We kind of took care of that. Yes. We the did. Yes. With the penalty, we yeah. took care of that. 
Right. It's just that they're the ones who said, wait, we want to fix yeah. this up. So, so poor Eleanor has to go back and <laughs> face. <laughs> She's smiling. Oh. She's smiling. She's smiling. I am happy to convey any message you all would like me. Is there a message? Here, uh, wait. Is there clarity on the message? Do you think you should start message? with doofus? <laughs> or... Oh, <he's> <laughs> <laughs> I, I offered you a clementine. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I guess, uh, so you are expecting next year a full proposal on how we might go forward with a more robust public financing op option. Expecting? <laughs> um, it sounds like you're expecting I, I would be pleased to see. Okay. But there's nothing you have in me to, to include in this in this bill to improve campaign finance situation at the moment. Other than public financing. I'd love to put public financing okay. on it. We just no, have to uh, No, I, it, it didn't say, no I think if, if no. We have lots of other ideas, but I think realistically, at this point, probably. Okay, just curious. I mean, I, I just wonder if anybody else has anything other than. Any idea how they're taking to S120? Um, Which it, one it is that? Not, this is the ban on corporate, corporate contributions. Our corporate contribution um, bill. Um, it has not yet come up, and uh, we are hoping to raise the Do we need the lobby made up? If you could. I will. I'll leave that to you. I will be happy, happy to do that. It certainly Particularly needs to come up. In the room, that's useful. Yeah. She had a big cake in her room last week when I went to Thank you. Time. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Paul. So I, I do think that we should have, um, although I don't understand a lot of it, I, I do think there are some issues here around this hyperlink issue because that is decreasing transparency maybe what maybe because, we could uh, yeah I, could maybe we could have some i wonder if i could find somebody who could have a screen yeah just walk us through yeah. creating an ad because I, I hear what paul's saying that basically if we pass the law they'll get in line but what if they i mean just wrap my brain. There's a lot of ways you can do different kinds of ads in Facebook, particularly. And I'm not sure I remember any of them being able to satisfy this. And, uh, so I'm not sure how we do that. I, I agree. I'm not as savvy as Chris is by a long shot. But uh, maybe we maybe we could find a consultant that does this who could at least help us think about it. Brandon, do you? Um, I, I could certainly. Uh, if, if, if somebody from the party couldn't do it, we could certainly find somebody who could walk you through different ways to create different Facebook ads if you just want to limit it to Facebook. Um, just just for the simplification of the discussion, to, and, and Facebook really is probably the most user-friendly approach to social media advertising. Um, so if we, if, I imagine if we got into some of the other digital vendors, we might see some glazed over eyes. Uh, and I may even glaze over my eyes. So, what if we had one of the smart boys from upstairs come work DII? Now, well, maybe. I mean, it's, 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 a right, but, um, but it's a different. It's a different level. But well, it's just a different skill set. I think set, that yeah. we want to know how we, to create. But well, we don't want to know how to create an ad. We want to know how we what want to see the difference. Well, I mean, it's, it's a it's a three minute. Pro I could walk that through long. it, but but the question kind of is: Is there a place where you would add this disclaimer, or do you have to bake it into the picture, which is kind which of is not discussed here, but I think was what they meant. I mean, I, I ran a Facebook ad that was a picture of my lawn site. Well, if you could magnify it on my lawn size, it's paid for by Pearson for Senate. So, does that cost the mustard? But I mean, I don't right, so I don't why, think why so, why because, it's small. because it's tiny. You know, by the time you have the context, I can't yeah. read it. You don't well, have to blow it up to read it's it. It's impossible but, to read. Well, and that's a, by. that would be a prime example of what I mentioned about Facebook ads. If it's a lawn sign, it had the text of, of Senator Pearson's name and, and maybe the website. Um, and making that that disclaimer text any larger um, might well, have disqualified could, might have disqualified his ability to to broadcast and sponsor that ad. So mm -hmm. I'd like to get somebody who does this and could come and just illustrate. The That's a great idea. Okay. 
Would you oh, see if you can find somebody, and if not, we'll yeah. try and find somebody. Would you have a preference for it to be somebody? I mean, uh, we we have staff who can do it at yeah. the party. I'm, I'm certainly comfortable doing it. Just otherwise. somebody. Yeah. Okay. Well, somebody who knows something. Yeah. If, <laughs> if, if, uh, if Gail would like to be in touch with me, at okay. the very least, we will find somebody. If sure. not, I'll do it, or somebody else on staff. Can Gail probably sure knows how to do it. Um, <laughs> On a very superficial level, yes. Gail does. Oh. Um, but, okay. Yeah. So we'll screen and stuff right Yeah. <laughs> All right. Anything else on this that. <coughs> okay. Okay. Good work. Okay. Thank you. Just